I'd like to show you a web application that shows Google Maps around schools using the Flask framework for the web application and the Google Maps API to draw the map. Here's the web app. We'll choose a school and here's a map around the school. We'll go back, choose the other school, here's a map around this school. Why don't we add a third school? Let's find another school. Walnut Creek Intermediate School. Notice these latitude and longitude values here. I'm going to copy them. And then I'm going to make a new element in this tuple of schools here. And I'm going to make up a, a key, which is just a way to uh, find the school. And I'm going to call this WCI, because that's what the kids call it. And here are the coordinates. I like things to line up, so I'm going to change these above here. OK, back to here. Let me go back, reload, and now we have Walnut Creek Intermediate. And there it is. Good. Why don't we see how the program works? First, I'll say that the styling here in the web page is done through Twitter Bootstrap. And if you haven't heard of that, that takes a lot of the hard work out of making buttons and having fonts that look nice together and displays that are responsive. In other words, look nice on a small screen and a large screen. Let's take a look at the code. Here is the Python module. It's called GMAP. And you see we import some things from Flask, and we create a Flask application. And we have a class here for the information that we store for each school. The key, which I said is just an identifier for it. And then the name, the latitude, and the longitude. And then here we define three schools. And here, so that we can look them up by the key, we create a dictionary using a dictionary comprehension, this for every school in this tuple of schools we create a key value pair where the key is this key one of these and the value is the school object just to take a look here you see when i choose one of these this is the key it's used here to present the right map here is the function that produces the main page, the index.html. That's the page that you get if you don't ask for anything after the slash. In other words, this page. And you should see a title and then uh, one button for each school that's defined in that tuple. And this function index is mapped to uh, nothing essentially. If there's a slash there or, or no slash even, it will produce a page from this template file index.html, which we'll look at. And it will also pass in to some Flask logic this schools tuple so that it has access to everything in there and can produce the buttons. Let's look at the index.html now. Here it is. You should recognize this as an HTML page. Um, there's some stuff at the top here for working on a variety of devices, including mobile devices. And this link here loads Twitter Bootstrap from another site. Um, Twitter Bootstrap uses divs with a class of container for the outermost container. And here's the H1 for choose a school. And then this is part of the templating language. You see the special symbols here. And the way you read this is for every school in the schools tuple, produce 
one of these paragraphs, and the paragraph has an anchor tag inside with these Twitter bootstrap classes that make the button. And the href is the school.key. Remember here in the class, school, each school has a key like this. Um, so this produces the href. And the school name here appears as the body of the anchor tag. And this ends the loop. Back to the program. That's the end of this part. Now let's look at this part, which is the second page that runs with the school code chosen. The uh, Flask allows us to say that anything that, is, that follows the slash is to be passed into this function in this parameter here, school code. And we'll use school code to look up in this schools by key. Remember, this is a dictionary mapping from the key to the school object for each of the three schools that we have here. And if we find the school in the dictionary, then we render from a template called map.html. And um, similar to what we did before, we pass in the single school that we want. We don't pass in the whole tuple of schools, just the one that was identified by the key. And if we don't find the key, then we produce a 404 error, which means page not found. And this line here runs the Flask application. Uh, the last thing to look at is this map.html that produces the second page. And here it is. And a lot of the beginning parts of it are the same as before. Um, here, this code here has to do with producing the Google Map. And this loads the Maps API from Google. And then this identifies one of our functions below that we call init map. And this creates the Google Map. And the Latitude and longitude come from the particular school that was selected and passed into this template. Here in the body element, we have an onload attribute with the value of init map, and that causes the init map function to be called when the page loads. And then here, another container div, we have the H1 with the school name and the word school. And then we have a div with an ID of map that's 100% wide, 900 pixels high. And it's empty, but the Google Maps API will fill it in because here's the ID of map. And here we've specified the ID of map. Okay, so that's a look at a Flask web application that uses the Google Maps API to show schools. And you can find the source code for this on GitHub. DC Brichetti. Go to Python Lessons and Web and Flask. And then you'll find GMAP. I just did it out of solidarity. <laughs> I think there was one person in there I didn't know. Um, but that was, you know, was kind of nice in a way. Uh, before we get started, um, quick show of hands. Does anybody not know Python? Okay. You may, this should be followable for you. Um, the one time we go kind of a bit deeper into some Python syntax, there's a bit of a little primer, which we'll see what we're doing for time. I also haven't had, 
I didn't have time to time this tutorial. So we're just going to see how we go. We'll play it by ear. There's a few detours we can skip or not skip as we feel free. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to keep up if you're not a Python programmer. There's a tiny little bit of JavaScript as well, but I promise it's not tricky. Um, is anyone here not a web programmer? I'm not telling, but how do you define a web programmer? Is this only the pretends to be one? Yeah, that's fine. A programmer is just not a web programmer. Sure. Also, yes, it's written in Python 2.7 because I left this too late to port all the depths up to 3. Is there a function called find out what Python uh, is? Python dash V will tell you. Sure, we will cover as much as we can. Yeah, um, like I said, there are a few detours in the slide deck, which, based on how we're going for time, we'll see how quickly we rush through them. I'm having trouble floating the first one. What does it say? Uh, the first one said, unable to connect, connection timed out. The second one, when I tried HTTPS, it said, uh, 403 forbidden. Did anyone else find it? You are connected to the Wi-Fi. Let me just start saying when I not tried it for HTTPS. I would have. Yeah, I would have thought it would have worked over HTTPS. I apologize for GitHub. Cool. Um, ideally, you'll be on the branch example one, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, are we good to go? AV people. Yep, I'm going to do that. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Flask 101. Um, before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Noongar people. Um, I want to acknowledge their elders past and present and anyone who's here today who is an elder of the Noongar nation. Um, so, my name's Danielle Maidley. I'm a programmer. I realized the other day I'd now been a professional programmer for a decade, and that kind of blew my mind, because I'm not that old. Um, I've been programming Python since I was 15, when I learned Python by taking a copy of the tutorial on the syntax reference to school, and writing Python by ruling indents across my page, then going home and typing it in and seeing it would have executed. Um, so maybe I have a Python VM in my head. I probably don't. Um, I work for a company called InfoExchange. We're a not-for-profit in Melbourne. Uh, we do technology for social justice. What this means is that we produce apps, usually on the web, to help community public health organizations, um, usually paid for by the government or sometimes by the organization themselves, depending on how much money they have. Um, can I move on from here? OK, good. Um, this is what we're going to be covering. I just ripped this off from the abstract. It's not quite in this order, because when I wrote the talk, I found the order doesn't quite make sense. So what is Flask? Why would we use it? The very quick hello world. Then some interesting stuff around form processing, using SQL Alchemy as your ORM, um, Object Relation Manager. Um, writing your first RESTful API. Um, we kind of gloss over that a bit more than I would have liked. Um, doing cool stuff by holding connections open, um, which nowadays has very much been replaced by WebSockets. Um, but we won't go into WebSockets, unfortunately. Um, testing, the most important thing. If anyone's seen a talk from me in the last year, it would have almost just guaranteed been about testing something somehow. Um, and finally, We'll do a deployment to OpenShift, because nowadays, who runs their own boxes? Um, sorry. The way this talk came about is um, I was working on an application. And this was 2012. And honest to goodness, it was still using CGI. It was executed as CGI scripts. 
And the performance was woeful, woeful because we were executing it up, loading the Python state, running the thing, writing it all out to a buffer, dumping it again. And just like, no, there's better ways. The first thing I said was, why didn't you use a framework? Um, and they went, oh, Django is too heavy. I'm like, well, it comes with a lot of stuff. I wouldn't say it's any heavier, but there's a lot of stuff in the box. Um, so Flask is not that. If Django is to come battery is included, then Flask is just the batteries. It's, it's not even the toy car. Um, out of the box, Flask can, can do request, response, templates, and URL routing. Um, everything else you might want, form handling, databases, REST, that sort of thing, all via extensions. So it does have a very rich extensions API. Please come in. Um, there's space over here if you need. Um, so it does have a very rich extensions API. And as you'll see, we'll go through and use that um, to do some of the cool stuff that we're going to do. So that's cool. Um, Flask is a WSGI application, um, W-S-G-I, which I've also heard pronounced whiskey, but then I didn't know what they were talking about. I thought they meant the delicious brown liqueur. Um, so as a result, in order to run a Flask application, you're going to want, or in production, you're going to want an application server. Um, you're going to want, say, Apache with mod WSGI, or G Unicorn, or G Event, or UWSGI. There's a lot of choices. Um, however, it's also very easy. Python comes with a built-in WSGI development server that will handle requests. Nice thing at WSGI is it provides a common interface for all the myriad of different ways web apps could conceivably talk to things. So if you don't like mod WSGI, um, or you don't like any of the modern app servers, you can talk fast CGI or something else via, still via the same API to the web server of your choice. Um, we won't go too much into, well, we won't go at all into the production side of that sort of thing. Um, but it's pretty well documented if for some reason you weren't using something like OpenShift or Heroku and you wanted to spin your whole stack up from the ground. Um, while I'm on the stack, if you follow the instructions on the readme, you'll have set up a virtual environment um, called VirtualEnv. Um, is anyone not familiar with VirtualEnv? Okay, VirtualEnv is just kind of a way to have a little pre-packaged Python environment. It won't, it won't pull in non-standard libs from outside Python. So you'll get your standard Python API, but then all the other random system stuff won't be there to make a mess of your day. And everything you install will be installed in that local virtual environment, so you can't make a mess of anyone else's day. And then you'll have this nice little self-contained thing to do your work. Administrators hate it because it becomes very hard for them to update packages when they get a CVE. So this is the boilerplate. Um, so we instantiate a Flask object, um, and then we'd say, if we are running you know, name equals main, uh, then just run the Flask object. And this will start Python's a little built-in WSGI server. Um, again, never in production, but fine in dev. So this then becomes our very first hello world response. Um, so you can see we write a function for our response, um, and we decorate it. Does anyone not know what a decorator is? Oh, excellent. Uh, we decorate it to say we want to put it at the URL slash. Um, if we then fire up our um, little server, so you should have already done the first couple of lines. If you just run the application and you go to the URL that it gives you, ideally it just works. So I've very stupidly lost my um, window and not in mirror. Ah, 
this is where it all falls down. Oh wait, I've got it. No, I don't. Looks like I've got the notes on my screen. Um, oops. So if we look here, we should have a web app directory. I've got a lot of PYC files. Awkward. Yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, yep, so you can see here we've got this in at pi. So if I just run that. It's going to start running this basic dev server. Nice thing about this dev, dev server is when you change your code, it will nuke all your threads and reload. Um, as long as your threads aren't serving a request. If they're serving a request, they won't reload. Mostly not a problem, but can be. Um, okay, so we can chuck in a few more responses. We can just go nuts with whatever we need here. Um, we can obviously do things. We can do redirects. We can render templates. Um, you can basically return whatever you need. You can set the MIME type. Um, I'll show you some examples of setting the MIME type on a raw object later on. Um, so templates. Templates in Flask use um, Ginger2. If you don't want to use Ginger2, uh, you could use something else. But the render template helper uses Ginger2 by default. Like I said, you can replace it, but Ginger2 is pretty good. Um, so by default, it looks for them in the templates directory of your package directory. Um, again, you can change this, but I don't know, that's pretty useful. Um, so yeah, example two is just going to do the same thing and show you using a template. Um, so we can Where's my window gun? So you can see go here. And if I go, we can get the same thing as a template. Um, and then the Ginger2 template, which we'll just, can everyone see this um, window, by the way? Or should I make this bigger? So this is a very basic template, which is just literally HTML. Um, what we can then do is add variables and other data to this. We can apply filters, um, which we will come to. Um, so. The next kind of thing you do, you've got stuff coming, you know, you've got a hello world. So now you want to handle some input, um, input on the web. You've got a few options, put it in the URL, put it in the query string, put it in a post request. Um, so query strings are pretty easy. We can get an object 
called request, and we can have a look at request.args. Um, and this is the value of the name key in the query string. It seems a bit weird, perhaps, if you're an um, object-oriented programmer, to have this global object called request, um, and then look at that. But it's kind of the way it works. Request will always be your current request you're handling. Um, that way you don't have to mess about with passing it through. They decided that you almost always need to interact with the request object and passing it 25 layers deep into your call tree or adding it to a class so that you always had it was, I guess, unnecessary, unnecessarily burdensome. So um, they decided they would just do this. Yes? It's not really global, is the part to understand. It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> so the concurrency works. Um, when you make requests to request, they're a proxied to your actual current state. So the type of object it's called is like a workzug proxy. Workzug is the underlying foundation layer. Um, and it will make it work for you. As I understand it, Yes. Even or it looks like a global object. It's actually a per request object. Oh, per request, yeah. Um, and then either your requests are threaded or they're processes or they're co threads, whatever magic you happen to be into. Um, do you know I don't know in Flask? I've never tried. Did you repeat the question? Are they read only was the question. Um, some parts. We won't actually, I don't think I have an example of it. There are some other objects um, that you can get. There is session, which is obviously stuff related to the session. You can write to that, and it will, like in certain cases, say pop out into the session cookie. Um, so you can add information that way. Um, there's also an object called G, which is the magic, it's magic global data that you want to hold on to for the lifetime of the request. Um, and so unlike the session cookie, which has to serialize your data out and back in, but lives forever, the G object just lets you store Python-esque things for the lifetime of the request. You can use it to do some dirty stuff. Um, the request isn't read-only, that was the question. Okay, it is not read-only, there we go. Um, so if you think query strings are kind of dated, which I do, um, there's also this syntax, which I'm quite fond of. Um, so you can say root slash item slash um, angle of braces int colon variable name or str colon variable name. Or actually anything you want, you can register new ones, but by default it has kind of those basic types there. Um, this then pops out as a variable to your method, and you can do what you need to do with it. So this way you get those nice kind of properly resource, resourcey APIs. Um, so you can have slash user, slash user, slash Danny, slash pull request, slash 15, um, and have it all pop out. Um, so this kind of thing is always a pain, because obviously before, if we, if we went request.args OU, we'd get just the first one. Um, so if you want all of them for some reason, if you don't want someone to just sit there tacking things on and maybe somehow exploit your app because you're expecting a single one and suddenly you've got a list, then it just gives you, it just gives you, I can't remember if it gives you the first or the last. Here I've said it gives you the first. Um, I, have a mem I have a feeling that Django and Flask are backwards and Django gives you the last. Um, but anyway, it'll give you one. 
If you just ask this, it will give you one item. To stop that thing, we have to check, well, is it a single, is it a list? Or the thing you have to do in Python CGI module, which is always just go list bracket zero bracket, because that's kind of annoying. Um, if you ask for a thing that's not present, then you get a key error. There is, however, this get list, which feels like it should do what it says on the tin, which is return the whole list of them. But then what secretly catches you out, or at least secretly caught me out a couple of weeks ago, is if you call get list on a key that isn't present, then it doesn't raise a key error, which is what I was expecting. It gives you an empty list. Um, and so I had an exception for Kiera, and it was falling through my code and blowing up later because I was trying to consume this empty list. Um, there's also a pop list, and you can also do pop. Um, trickily, if you pop something, you get a string, but all the other values go away. So I don't believe there's a way to just pop the individual values unless you call get list and then pop that list, if, if that's what you need to do. Um, get requests are great, but we can't encode massive amounts of data in them. So then, obviously, the other thing we care about is post requests. Um, so it exposes this via, um, via a variable called form, or an attribute called form. And this works the same way. There's also an attribute called files, which we use for file uploads. Um, I won't go into that. There's some pretty good examples in their documentation. But if we're having to go through and manually do all of this, because everything's going to be a string. All things that come in via that variable are strings. We don't know any better. Um, so we're just better off just using a library and getting away from the world of hell that is type coercion. Because otherwise, we may as well have just done import CGI and suffered through it. Um, so if anyone's looked at Django or Rails, they'll be quite familiar with, with this sort of thing. Um, this is a very simple rego form. And I've said I want a text field. I call email. Um, I want it to have the string email. Um, and then when I handle my request, I um, just say, OK, it can handle the get method or the post method um, so that I can retrieve the page and then post back to itself. Um, and then this tricky bit here. So if the form was submitted and it validates, then we want to return the response success as a string. In all other cases, we want to return the template with the form object. And where this gets a little bit trickier again is the form object could be one of many things. If they made a get request, the form object will be a blank form with all the bits and pieces set up. If the form object, if they made a post request, and the form object contains data, but the data um, wasn't valid for some reason, then we return the form object with the data and with some errors. Um, so you can see here, when we return the response, we're passing a variable into the template. Um, the other thing that you'll see here is that we've um, now just set a secret key. Um, we use this secret key for a few things. One of them is to encrypt our session cookie, um, and the other is to sign a CSRF token. Um, CSRF, if you're not a web developer, is cross-site request forging. It's where somebody proxies your page um, and then sends a result back so they can do an attack against you in the middle. Um, the idea would be that they wouldn't have that token set as a cookie because we generated it for this user and gave it to them as a cookie. And the single domain policy means they would have a different cookie. Um, so these 
app secrets are actually really secret. Um, without them, people can launch attacks against your site. Um, so you shouldn't actually ever have them in source code. I put it here just to make it work. Ideally, your app secret is being provided to you by something, and a config file that's generated for the server or on the fly. Yes? And that, that, that's unique for your application, or it's on a per session basis? How it's unique it? for your application. So you have one of them, and, and, and you install your application, and this year and five years from now, in theory, the, the secret's still the same. Yes. Um, okay. The, no, no, the request no. token is different every time. We just use the secret to encrypt it. So it's the right, right. To sign it so you can tell that no one else has it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so ideally, these are provided for you by somebody else. Don't put them on GitHub. If you put them on GitHub and nobody overrides them, your app, where it's installed, will be compromised. Um, and someone will start doing stuff to you, probably decrypting all your users' sessions and fiddling with them particularly if you do things like trust the session to tell the server what someone's auth credentials are. Um, if that's not encrypted or if the token it's encrypted with isn't a secret, I can decrypt it, change it to another user, re-encrypt it again, yeah, and then play that back to the server and go, oh, cool, you're admin, no worries. Um, so here we use it because Flask will try to do cross-site request forgery protection and will um, say, hey, there's no secret. Um, I'll show you later on when we deploy to OpenShift how to get that secret more safely. Um, we can also chuck in some validators. Yes, I'm sorry, that does kind of fall off the screen. Um, so this is the same thing. Uh, the email variable is a text field called email. It has two validators. This is a tuple. One of them is data required. So this field is required. Um, the other being that it should be an email. Um, WTF forms gives you um, probably about two dozen of these. Otherwise, you can write your own. Um, they, you will eventually write your own because you'll start having things that check between multiple things to check an overall condition. You'll be like, this date has to be after that date because it's the end date and that's the start date. That sort of thing. Is there any built in sanitization? Sanitization. Of uh, text that users have entered that ends up in your application. Uh, is that the raw, the raw string that you, they've typed in? Yes. Okay. So if you want to add a sanitization layer, it's up to you to manage that? Yes. So. Typically, you would do that if you're displaying user text or user entered data, you would do it in the template. Um, it's a good question. I didn't have a demonstration of that. The filter is called safe. Um, I'll show you a filter later on. Um, but that would then escape your data out. If you need to do something like take in raw HTML from CK editor or that sort of ilk of thing, and so you need to then display the HTML unescaped. You will need to write your own field that passes it through um, LXML's HTML tidy or something. That is a classic mistake that I see in code. Um, one of our smaller sites got compromised that way because the guy just left it out. Um, yeah, so this is the raw, the raw data in the format that you've asked for it. So you said it's a text field, it'll come through as a string. If you ask for an int field, it will apply some sanitization, I guess, to get it to an int, in that if it contains things that aren't part of the integer, it'll just raise a validation error and say, what are you talking about? This isn't an integer. Um, okay, so this is now example three. So this is the template that we have so far. Um, this is the middle of it at least. So it's pretty easy. We're creating a form. Um, we have a thing called form.email. And we say we want the label. That's that bit we put in the string um, just here. 
And then we want the actual form widget itself, which is form.email. And then finally, we have this thing, form.email.errors, which is any validation errors we have from that form element, which are basically just exceptions. Exceptions get raised in the validator, and it catches that validation exception and throws the string back. Um, there's also the bit at the top, the hidden tag. This is the bit that um, handles the CSRF. So as well as giving you back the cookie for the request, it will also be written into the form. And if they don't match, then it knows someone's done something dodgy and manipulated your um, form or playing it from the wrong location. Um, so by default, if you don't have that, Flask will just go um, and give you a 403, I think, 4 or something. Um, you can turn it off, but don't. Um, yeah, it's one of those things that if you have a really legitimate need for not doing it, then I guess you could not do it. But instead, consider writing a proper cross-origin API and talking to that. Um, so that basically, I guess, sums up input. And so you've got a form, you've got some input, we've got the basis of an output template, it's pretty low tech. Um, so let's store some data. I mean, this is kind of the other part. It's the big part of web apps, and it's the big part that a lot of people have always traditionally screwed up. Um, yeah, I honestly saw an app that we have shipping in production that has raw SQL in the query string. And I was just like, I wonder. Oh, look at that. There's the table. I could just dump it out. Um, yeah, thankfully someone had denied drop. But I could just select arbitrary data. It had no protection. Um, so SQL Alchemy is, I guess, the Python ORM. If you're not using the Django ORM, you're undoubtedly using Alchemy. Uh, just, uh, does anyone else have any problem uh, running the example three? I get a module object, there's no attribute data field, data required. Sorry, if it's just me, then um, just ignore it. Pip, uh, 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 yeah, pip install dash r requirements.txt. Sorry. It kind of, it was a bit organic. I meant to move them all back to be in the first example. Um, and then apparently I forgot. Um, the idea would be that you had all the requirements when you started. Whoops. Um, so yeah, um, Alchemy is like the de facto ORM. It has the nice property that it's unopinionated. It doesn't make assumptions about schemas or what they might look like. Um, you can change the names of tables, you can change the names of columns, you can say, I want to call this in my Python object, but it's called this in the database. You can explain some quite complex relationships. Nowadays, you can do that in Django as well, but Django's assumption was always that it was going to create databases that match its idea of the world. Um, Alchemy then has kind of also gone, well, let's make it a bit easier for people and add a lot more defaults. Um, so this is using Flask Alchemy, um, which adds some of this extra default stuff back in to say, hey, 90% of the time, my column which I've assigned to ID is just called ID. My column that I've assigned to email is just called email. So Flask Alchemy also handles some other nice stuff like assigning database connections to execution threads in the pool um, so you have the right number of cursors and you don't accidentally select somebody else's cursor, that sort of thing, suddenly screw up someone else's transaction. Um, so this is a very basic model. You create a table called users in my database, um, contains some columns. The other thing I need to then do is I need to tell it where my database is. So Flask Alchemy provides a config variable. 
um, SQL Alchemy database URI, which <coughs> looks like a reasonably standard database URI connection string that a lot of things will now give to you. Um, so that's cool. We can then do our standard SQL Alchemy kind of things, so we can select for a user, that sort of stuff. Uh, you of course need to create the database and maintain the schemas, which this wouldn't have done for you. Doing that by hand is the worst thing ever. I never do it. Thankfully, Alchemy has a um, kind of side project thing called Alembic. Um, Alembic is a database migration system similar to South in Django, all the built-in stuff in Active Record Rake in Ruby. Um, it's confusingly called the Flask Migrate, not Flask Alembic. That's something else. Um, I think it might be an older project. Uh, apparently, I had a detour at this point. That's cool. Um, so up to now, we've just been calling app.run with our command, which is great. Um, it lets us run the server. But if we want to do things like prepare content or update the database, we need to um, be able to do other things. And like the old hand Python people, and I guess the old hand C people go, oh, cool, import op parse. Let's, let's do this. Um, but somebody's already done it for you. So there's a pretty commonly used extension called Flask Script. Um, and this is the easiest instan instantiation of it. By default, it will give you two commands, shell and run server. Um, which come with the kind of options that you would, that you would like to have. Um, so now you can just do this, and then you can go, okay, dot slash, in at pi, run server, and you'll get the kind of thing you expect. So you can see it gives you some nice help. Let's you do what you need to do. The reason we had that little detour is because lots of people have started to write command plugins using Flask script. So um, Flask Migrate has one of those which will add all the DB management commands for us. So we can expand our example to this sort of thing. And we say, OK, if I run the DB command, then that will add some extra bits and pieces. So at this stage, what we want to do is go, OK, I want to initialize my migrations. This will create, a, it says, what it's saying is I want to initialize this project to have database migrations. Um, so it'll create a directory called migrations, um, and we need to add that. The next thing we'll do is capture the initial state of the database um, by creating a first initial migration. So DB migrate says, I want to create a new migration. It will try to look at your database. So all the database models you've created, it will try to go, what's new, what's changed, and try to create the file for you. It's not bad. Um, it'll occasionally come up with problems. So that will create the versions directory, which we need to add. And then finally, we say, OK, upgrade. And by default, that will upgrade to the latest version. But otherwise, it will not. That was very descriptive of me, wasn't it? Oh, I'm on the wrong branch. Sorry. So you can see here, I have two migrations because this example, example four, I've made two changes to the database. Once to add the initial schema and then once to grow it. Um, 
migrations in Alembic are as a um, linked tree. It also then will write a version number into your database for you. So, so it happens. So if we That's fun. It didn't work until I sued over for some reason. Oh no, I know what it is. I'm not actually in my virtual environment. Yeah, I still have some trouble doing clients because I have to actually sue them. Yeah, I have been told to clients. So you can see now I have this DB command. And if I go DB current. going to show me where I am on my little SQLite database. I can then either choose to downgrade that or upgrade that or create a new migration. If I create a new migration, it'll come up as empty because I'm on the current version. Um, if we have a look then, So you can see here in, um, in tables, besides the users table that's ours, we also have this table called Alembic version, which contains the metadata. So that's just a um, scalar of the version number. So we could downgrade we can go both directions with our migrations. We can drop backwards, we can go forwards. Okay, um, so that's cool. And at this point, hopefully we have a working database. Um, you should better run a DB upgrade and get to the latest version of a database, um, including all that initial stuff. It should take you as far as you need, including creating all the tables and that. Because this example used SQLite, it should just work. Um, so we can tie then this what together. We've got a model now, which has some data in the database. We have a form. We could write a view that then sat there and going, OK, I want to copy this value off my form object to this value in my model, and this value off my form object to this value in my model, or we can just put free. So this will say that um, for, this, for this database model, create a form. This constructor then can take arguments like what fields we actually want to create. Um, it can also take arguments what validators we want, what sort of widgets we want. Um, so here's to say, OK, I want to validate it, that it's an email. It already knows that it's required because the database definition says the field can't be null. So we know we have to write something in there. We can force it if we have to, if it could be null. But in this particular form, it can't be. Um, but the options for that were quite documented. So at this point now, our little registration um, program will look like this. By default, if it's a GET request, we'll just pop, um, pop the request out. Otherwise, if it's a POST request, um, if it's a POST request, we create the form. We try to tie the form to the object it comes from using the ID. Um, we then attempt to populate the object from the form, and then we'll add it and commit the result. And then we'll finally redirect back to the registration page. So this is example four, which
Let's find mouse card. So this database has been around a while, so it says 19 users. So then try to add something unvalid. It's going to produce that error saying, no, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Try to add something that is valid. Redirect it back the page. We now have 20 users. Um, if I select that database, you can see um, all the things. You can also up there see the ones that I added in before I had the validator. And at that point, they obviously got accepted, written into the database. This example is quite interesting because not only do we pass the form variable into the template, but we also now pass this lazily evaluated query. And what we can do there Just up here is now we have that example of using a filter. So I've said, okay, I have this variable um, called users, um, and I can now filter that to get the number of users that are actually in there. Um, and you hope that filter does something sensible with the um, SQL. Um, so this might be. At my day job, I'm a Django programmer at the moment, so I couldn't remember when I wrote this example. I'm pretty sure this is correct, but in Django, it catches you up. You have to call dot count, which is a method. Um, but at this point, it will lazily evaluate the SQL and call select count star for, um, from users. Um, so did you have a question at the back? No? Okay. Um, how are we going for time? About halfway through. Cool. Um, so that kind of should give you the basis of writing fairly boring create um, update type application. Um, at least hopefully connect you up with the docs so that you can kind of get your head around them and start doing the other kind of things you want to do. Um, so I thought I'd kind of need to do some of the cool stuff, like emitting an event stream. So this is the kind of thing I think of here is, for example, in Facebook with its own little notifications thing. And we're going to do push events. Um, so I'm saying I'm wrong. So quick detour into generators. Does anyone not know what a generator is? OK. So a generator in Python is a stateful thing that produces results um, that you instantiate. And then every time you call next on a, or in Python 3, underscore, underscore, next, underscore, underscore, it will cough up another result. And a whole state, it's got a little state object in there. So when we write our function, like we can, instead of having to write a class and have it hold state and all this other stuff, um, we can write it as a function using the magic keyword yield. So this function gen is a generator um, that yields an infinite Fibonacci sequence. Um, it will never end. It just simply sits there looping, 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 and just yielding more values, and yielding more values, and yielding more values. Um, it is a full-blown Python iterable, which means we can iterate it. And 
obviously it will never end. It will just keep yielding values and this bit of code will not stop executing until you kill it. We can make it stop by dropping off the end of the function. You can also make it stop by raising an exception called stop iteration, which says just all iterators, all things that consume iterators are meant to check for stop iteration. And if that gets raised, they go, ah, oh, my generator exhausted itself. So I think technically in generator land, this actually raises stop iteration on you, but you don't have to know about that. And so this will generate n elements of the sequence and will end. Sorry, was there a question? No, 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 I just, I'm sorry, I just lose something. Sorry. Okay. So that's cool. It would do at this point what we expect. What's nice about Flask is that we can use generators to emit a response. If we need to, the, I mean, the most classic example is if you want to do a file download, the rookie mistake is to go open file, um, cool, read all the contents and write them out. That is like CGI mistake one. And typically it just comes along that somebody opens a 480 megabyte file and your process blows up because it gets oom killed. Um, in CGI, you can kind of just then do a, um, do a splice and splice one file descriptor to the other. You can't do that in WSGI, but we can write a generator that will stream the data out in nice, easy to manage blocks. Um, in fact, even more nicely than Python has a version of read that is a generator and will give you nice, easy to consume blocks as well. So you can just go for i in blah, yield i, and it will just stream your file out for you. Or you can even just pass that generator as your response. Um, but so we can use it to implement our event stream because we can just keep yielding events. So we have an example that looks like this. In this example, um, what's important here, besides the generator, is that we are obviously creating a raw response and specifying the MIME type. This is much like some of the other responses where this is the content as a generator. It doesn't have to be a generator. It can just be text or bytes, whatever it needs to be. Um, if it's a generator, it'll go, oh, cool, I'll generate that for you. Um, and then we can specify return data, like headers, a MIME type, stuff that we need. So we have this generator. Uh, we very creatively called it generate. Um, we shall just, at this point, loop forever, yielding events. And I've kind of left get event like out of this implementation. And we'll generate this event stream object. Event stream is a W3C standard for a stream of events. It's basically data colon space, whatever you would like, two enters, and then another one, and then another one. And you just hold that connection open, and every time you want to emit, you just write data colon space and two enters, um, and it will come out. Some browsers support this natively, others you need a shim. But it's a nice way to emit a stream of events. The other tricky part now, just thing, is that we need to um, use a web server capable of handling multiple requests at once because this example is going to hold our, um, our request open forever. So we need to say, cool, I want a threaded server that can handle multiple requests. Um, but there's a trick. The server would like to gracefully finish your request, and this request will never end because it'll just keep generating events ad infinitum. So this was kind of a little bit of a side in the implementation. We hook the server command to add some concept of when we wanted to shut down. 
and then we add that into our solution. So our full solution, which annoyingly doesn't have a slide, So this is example five, if you'd like to look on your own screens. So there's a few bits going on here that I've glossed over a little bit more than is probably fair. Um, this is the part that we just had which is that we try to get an event out of an asynchronous event queue. Um, we wait for one second. If we don't, the call stops blocking, and we drop through with an empty exception, which we ignore. And then we go back and say, are we still running? Yes, cool, try for another second to get this event, which means this thread will wake up once a second to try to see if it has any events. Um, to populate the queue, we use what's called a signal, um, Flask has signals when certain events happen, um, which we will find out about next time. I think it's next time we enter the re request loop. So we can decorate this method to say that when we get the message flashed signal um, to execute this function, um, and so the message flash signal, so no, they exited another thread, that's right. Um, so the message flash signal will be, a message flash is just whenever you call the flash command, which is just a way to put messages into the session buffer to be like, your object was saved successfully. Um, so here we're using it for the event stream. So we can do something cool with it in some Ajaxy way and say your object was saved successfully. Um, so we can push objects into this asynchronous thread safe queue. And then in that other thread, we can pull them out and add them to the ongoing request object. I apologize if this is incredibly, incredibly vague. There's also just format message, just a thing to wrap it up in some JSON. So it just calls um, json.dumpS, and then the value of our message. Um, sorry, like a really trivial question. But yep. in terms of checking the server every like one second or whatever, you know, check a queue to see if it's got any saved there. Um, is that how like you would going to check this, or would it be like an event-based thing? Like, is it wasteful to check every second? Or? It's not wasteful to check every second. Um, any computer ever, I mean, your computer has to wake up at least every three seconds because that's how USB works. Um, there's enough wake-ups. This will do it properly. Where it'll say, is this thing in the queue? Cool. Um, Colonel, put me to sleep. Um, like, and wake me up in either when something happens or in one second. We could, like the other solution to this problem is to write some magic object into the queue It's horses for courses. Um, I've seen people literally write stop iteration into the queue. So that would be like needlessly complex, would you say? Or? Yeah, I, I find just occasionally every second going, oh, should I have shut this thread down? It's fine. Yes. You probably want to repeat the comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the question was, is waking up every second bad? Um, and the answer is that, to be honest, not really. You wake up more often than that anyway that the kernel will just put you to sleep and wake you back up when something happens or in a second. Um, and it's not even a very accurate second. Like, it'll wake you up in a second-ish when it wakes up. Um, because we're misusing the producer-consumer event queues, you also need to call this task done to make things disappear from the queue. 
we could write our own threaded or thread safe queue implementation, but the standard library has this one, so why not use it? Um, does anyone have any more questions on this? Did I gloss over this too quickly? No? Cool. So the other side, I put this huge warning, and then I realized, actually, it's not that much code. Um, kind of just looks like this. So there's a very nice jQuery plugin which handles the W3C event source like design. If your browser has event source, it uses that and effectively becomes a no op star wrapper. If your browser doesn't have event source, it emulates it using native jQuery. Um, so we can literally say, cool, put, give me the whatever was in my request to start with, and then connect to the event stream and start receiving new events. The, the flash messages is also cleared at the end of the request. So every time we reconnect, this would be empty. We could also just keep it alive forever and never flush it out or save it to an object, depending on what you want to do, what you want to do with those messages. If you're being, I guess, Facebooky, you would actually write them to a database. And then when you wrote, you would use the save signal to track when you updated that table. And then you would have that cough the messages out. But I used this because it was here. Um, so executing this example, which is number six, um, this has the tricky step that I delivered the dependencies via Bower which if you're not using it and you're in the web world, then you've got to start using it. Um, Bower is a, if pip is package management for Python, then Bower is package management for front-end JavaScript. So you can go Bower install jQuery or Bower install whatever you like. Um, if you look in the top level there, there's a, um, there's a bower.json file which um, tells you what packages we're using and what versions of those packages we're using. So it makes it so much easier, particularly in a big web app, you're going to depend on Angular maybe or Bootstrap or jQuery, jQuery UI. You're going to depend on so much stuff. And this way you don't have to care. You can just have the versions in a file. Someone wants to change a dependency change the file, run the thing. It's like, it's package management. Then knocked together this very quick little collect static that will pick them up from Bower and copy them into our static location, which is a thing that it defaults to, in this case, web app static on somebody else's server. Hopefully they'll give us an environment variable that tells us where it is or some other documentation to say, hey, put your static content here. By static content for the non-web apps in the room, web devs, I mean the stuff that isn't being generated by the server. So all your images and your JavaScript and your style sheets and maybe even some of your HTML, depending on what you do. Um, or tonally, if you think that was kind of crack and you hate it, um, then, whoops, what did that do? Then there is WebSockets. This requires a plugin to gevent or another server capable of adding a WebSockets middleware. It also requires a browser that supports it or a shim. Um, people always say to me, they're like, oh, why aren't you using WebSockets? And I'm like, I don't know. It's still kind of new, and I'm kind of comfortable with changing a lot of code. That other one will work everywhere that you can do Ajax. So. So I've just totally lost my, um, my thread. The other thing about serving in production for the um, thing is you don't necessarily need to care about killing all the old event stream threads. You can just let the server reload, let those old threads keep serving what they were serving. When the user leaves the page and the connection drops, they'll be cleaned up and respawned, writing the new version. 
How are we going for time? We're about an hour through. Cool, I think we're just on about time. So we've done all this. We've written this really cool app. It's got all these cool things. So we want to do some testing. I personally really like PyTest. Of all the test frameworks, it's my favorite by far. Um, some people think it's crack. Um, those people who don't like madly, magically fiddling with the assert keyword and doing creepy stuff that you don't understand deep down in the Python um, interpreter, I like it. You could easily do these same examples with Nose or, um, or with Python's built-in unit test, but I think PyTest is pretty cool. So Flask provides us with some with some utilities to make stuff easier for us. The most important of which being a test client, which will do HTTP requests um, to the Flask application. So what we can do is create some fixtures in PyTest, which we've made available to all of our tests um, to do the things we need them to do. So the first one, you can see these are session fixtures, which means that they'll be created once and constantly reused. If you need, you can make them, you can change the scope. They can be module fixtures or they can be single test fixtures. I was like, I want to know what happened. Like if I jam my state, <coughs> like if my state can't be reused, I kind of wanted to know about that so I don't recreate them. Um, so the first thing that I do here is I spin up a fixture for the database. Um, I say, yeah, it's a testing database. I give a URI, which in my example is an SQLite memory instance. There's two schools of thought here about how to test things against the database. My school is test on the thing you use on. So if you use Postgres, test on Postgres, create a second Postgres database and test with that because if you go through and you write all your unit tests against SQLite and then you go and deploy to Postgres and suddenly have real types and real like transactional semantics and like real um, constraints and you go, oh, but it works in the unit tests, doesn't help you. So create like even if on your test harness you have to spin up a Postgres server and create, a, like, create an empty DB, do that. The nice thing about here specifying the URL is we can say, cool, okay, it's called my app underscore test. Tools like Travis, if you're doing CI on Travis, has a thing go, oh yeah, I want a Postgres 9.2 server. And it will just do that for you and pop out an environment variable saying, here's your test database. Um, I think I've stressed that point sufficiently. Test on the real thing. We can then do a test of our view. Um, so this one's pretty, pretty low tech. We just go and get the slash URL and we check that it has a title. Um, again, PyTest does this magic assert rewriting. So if that's not true, it will give us a difference and highlight the bit that's different and all this other cool stuff. That kind of blows people's minds, but it's better than self.assert equal. And so we can run, run our tests like this. Ideally, if you run PyTest, it'll go hunting for tests, but it has this bad habit of hunting for all the tests in your virtual environment as well, and that takes a while. You can control those settings. I just hadn't got around to adding it in this example. Um, you can then go a bit further and do things like mocks, which I'm just going to show you an entirely different piece of code because I was struggling with it last night. I don't know, I didn't want this to be too much of a, um, 
tutorial on how to do testing. So I haven't included heaps and heaps. If you would like this code, it's also on GitHub. And I'm more than happy to talk to you later on about how to do things like mocks. So this is a piece of code here that um, will mock in an entire fake OAuth server into the, um, into the system. So we can just grab the Flask app, create some extra routes, fiddle with some variables that say where to go when you're redirecting, and then send back some fake replies so it thinks it connected to OAuth correctly and correctly authorized. And then I can continue to check that I do the right stuff once I've authenticated to the server. Um, again, you can do the sort of like the classic sort of stuff where you can control one end by making it do requests and then give it like fake the endpoint that it connects to and just send back canned responses. And you're in the go, oh cool, yeah, and now do this. It's not a real world integration test, but this is unit testing. So that was a very quick tour of testing. And the final thing is getting an app into production. And so you spend a time writing this app and it runs on the dev server that you've got. And you've got, okay, that's cool. And now where to go? And once upon a time then, you'd have to get a server and the server would have to be running Apache and you'd have to have mod whatever. And nowadays you can just go to someone like Heroku or whatever, and I like OpenShift because they're from our friends at Red Hat, and it's actually open source. You can run OpenShift on your own hardware um, or your own virtual whatever, and it, it's nice. I also like that they call their plugins cartridges. It makes me think of um, my old 8-bit Nintendo, and I go, <laughs> So the standard Python cartridge it's pretty easy. It has two basic entry points. One, when it builds, it runs setup.py in your top level, which it expects to just be a standard um, setup tools or distutils or whatever flavor you want of setup.py. The other thing it will try to do is import WSGI application application and use that as your WSGI app. Uh, the full documentation for being a Python developer in OpenShift is that one. So setup pi is easy. Um, all I've done here is instead of retyping the requirements, I just read them out of the file, which is what that horrible little um, expression is. I sort of wish that thing, you could add to the build hook to do pip install dash r requirements.txt, but I don't know. This is officially, like, it wants the list of requirements. This is the list of requirements. If I package it up, then this is the list of requirements. I could have put them in here to start with, but, yeah, I don't know. Um, this file is pretty much just copied from their base template. Um, if you create a blank OpenShift Python app right now, it will give you a whole bunch of files by default. And one of them is this file. The only thing that I've added to this is um, the last part where I grab my application and I um, instantiate that as a variable called application. So when it goes from whiskey.application import application, it gets the right thing. <coughs> you could do whatever you wanted at the end here. Um, whatever you need to do at least. Yeah, this file basically just says, okay, my repository contains Python modules, and then I want the virtual environment, and then, yeah, I wanna make sure in the virtual environment, cool, now X, import my code. 
the final part in my init pi is I need to actually set up my configuration properly. So you can see here now that I'm getting my secret key. I'm keep making sure that I have defaults still so that if I'm running on my dev server, it still works. So I attempt to get OpenShift secret token, which is a secret token they've assigned me, and hopefully then not something I shove in GitHub. Um, I'm then getting their database connection string. And similarly, if that falls down, I'm just using SQLite locally because I'm a sucker for punishment. I should be using Postgres. But I didn't want to start Postgres on my laptop today. So the only reason I didn't um, is because then what usually happens is at some point I reboot my laptop, forget to restart Postgres, and go, why doesn't it work? Yes? Is, is the normal way to bring that uh, secret token into an environment variable? It's one way. The way we actually use at work is the Puppet deploys a Python file in with the rest of our settings. We have a setting like a config.py. It then gives us a Puppet config.py. And at the end of config pi, we go import puppet config. Okay. Yeah, because the people on your machine can probably find out what that value is. People, like people as this user could find out, but this is an LXC container, so it's safe. Okay. I, it's a good point. If you're on a multi-host machine that other users can log into, yes, they can go to proc, blah, env and get your environment. Um, and so that would be insecure. In this case, this is how they give it to us because these machines are LXC containers on a machine you can't access and don't have privileges. Okay. I think also to get someone's environment, you do need to, I don't think. I don't remember for sure. I'd have to check. I don't have that helpful. Check. Yeah, it depends on your permissions whether they get someone else's environment. But it is an exploit. In this case, this is how they do it. And it saves me having to generate a key. Okay. Um, the other thing I do here is I set my, um, oh, it's fallen off the edge of the screen. I set my static directory to be, um, OpenShift say that for your static content, they want it in the directory whiskey slash static inside the, repo, inside the repository directory. So I've said, if I have a key called OpenShift repo der, then I want my static files to be in OpenShift repertoire slash whiskey slash static. And then when in my build process, I run that collect static command, it'll grab the files that I want from Bower and put them there so they can be served out to people. If they do something weird, like say they want it in whiskey slash static and on the web server, they serve it as slash assets, something like that. There's another um, setting you can pass to Flask which says that my assets directory will be in slash assets. If it's coming from a CDN, you can do a very similar thing. Or at that point, you can probably just fix it in your code. They are being served from the web server. This is just so Flask knows where they are. Um, so there's a, um, there's a command called find resource, which will tell me where on the disk they are. And then there's another one called static URL. I can't remember what it's called. I know what it's called in Django, but that will tell you where on the URL tree they are so that you can do the right thing. And that way, when you deploy to different environments, you still get the right stuff based on your config. Or you can just hard code it all in your template. But eventually you'll regret that. So the other thing I forgot to say before this talk is, hey, set up OpenShift if you wanted to deploy it live. Um, how much time do we actually have? Oh, Not 20 minutes. really 20 minutes. I think so. It's great. Oh, is it? Nice. OK. Um, do we want to do this? Do we want to see how much it screws up? Look 
for that. I'm probably even logged in. RHC app create example. So this is saying that I want a Python 2.7 app that I'm calling example. The no git thing just says don't try to check out the git repo because we're already in a git repo. I have an outstanding complaint with them that it should use the git repo you're in if it looks like you're in one. So that's just going to do some stuff. I've said by default, I don't want it to scale. I don't want it to hot deploy. All these are things you can eventually do, but we won't do them today. Um, this is also using a free account, so I don't know that I get scaling. Um, while that's doing its thing, which could be a couple of minutes, depending on how loaded their um, new VM spinner upper is. Does anyone else have any other questions so far? Yes? Thanks for a really nice overview of how to do it. Um, is, it um, is it possible to actually um, download the code, your code? Yes, the code is on... Um, oh, no, stop that. It's got this idea that it doesn't have my public key, but it does have my public key. So it just created me a new key for a thing I don't even want. <laughs> um, what's scary is I'm pretty sure if I'd already had a key called IDRSA, I'm pretty sure it would have just tried to upload it to Red Hat. Mm -hmm. I hope that's a... The tool is written in Ruby, so I shouldn't think so. Um, it seems to be a new thing. So maybe Red Hat have decided to um, hack us all by stealing our public keys. <laughs> so we've created an app on the server, which if we... Um, Oh, uh, yeah, so gears are the things that run. Gears are the things that run stuff. So a single web app might be a gear or a celery. Um, QRunner might be a gear. And so I think the reason I can't scale also because I have no other gears left. This is my demo gear. So it dropped us in with that, um, that uninspired it there. So if I then, oops. Uh, somewhere here it should have my git URL. Where's my mouse? So they've created me a git repo. So if I go git remote add um, rhc, that git URL. Um, so the other part that you need to do is you need to add a database cartridge. They've recently added Postgres 9.2, so you can stop punching yourself in the face. <laughs> when I first started using OpenShift, it was because Heroku wanted uh, $200 a month for me to have PostGIS. And I went, oh, that's amazingly cool because um, OpenShift will give it to me on a demo and they won't shut my VM down every couple of hours. But then I discovered it was Postgres 8.3 or 8 point whatever. And I was like, particularly because that's PostGIS 1.5, which is especially horrific. So that's now spinning up a Postgres server for me and taking up some time. You can add a number of these cartridges. Unfortunately, what you can't do if you're into it for some reason is have a cartridge that has both Python and Node on it at the same time, which is a thing that maybe I tried to do. Um, yep, so that's cool. So now if we go git push force rhc. So we just blat its copy of master with our example 0 
Yes. Uh, I noticed the syntax for fast is so similar to bottle. Is there do you know in history about that to be appropriate? Bottle is a fork of flask, as I understand it. Um, I couldn't tell you why that is. I've personally never used bottle outside of one. I went to a thing on bottle and Python 3. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's just like Flask. So I couldn't, I couldn't tell you about why or wherefore. So you can see here, um, because we've done our push, it's doing our build process, sort of run setup pi install. And it will then run the contents of some other files, which are oh, I'm on the wrong branch. I think that's the, it's the classic one over the years of it, when everyone switched to Git. The most thing said commonly in presentations now is, I'm in the wrong branch. So we've got these pair of files. And these are just executable scripts that will do stuff that we want OpenShift to do for us. This one when we build, which happens when we do a git push. And this one when we deploy, which also happens when we do a git push, but later once all the services are back online. So you can see here, it's kind of still doing that initial build. It's very confusingly installing Bower from NPM because OpenShift also don't provide Bower in their default image. So I just, they do provide NP NPM, so just went NPM install Bower. If you need depths that otherwise aren't available, that's actually kind of a pain in the neck. That's the problem with platform as a service. So that'll keep doing its thing. Those um, little build scripts are I mean, pretty straightforward. We're just saying, cool, um, add NPM's binaries to binaries, executables to my path. Set this variable to make sure it's somewhere that's writable. Not all of OpenShift is writable by various people. Um, they install Bower, install Bower's dependencies, install that into my app. And then once the database is back online, upgrade the database to the latest version of the schema. If I ever need to do something as horrible as a downgrade, I would have to do that manually. The interesting thing to note with these tests is in my test harness we did before, I wasn't testing the migrations. If you are a purist, you should at some point also write a test that tests the migrations actually work. Um, and then if you're an especially purist, you write a test that tests you can go backwards. But often my opinion then is you do, your, you do your upgrade in a transaction. If it fails, you just stop and you go, crap. You do your downgrade. No one ever seems to test downgrades. Just kind of, that's how it is. Ooh. And that just blew up. Ah. Oh. Apparently, Bower in NPM doesn't run right now. <laughs> so this wouldn't have finished deploying. That's awkward. Um, yeah, so it's blown up in a JavaScript error, and so it's failed to do that collect static because it's trying to ask Bower. It's going, all those dependencies you installed, where are they? OK, so that's actually not going to work, and that's a shame. Um, as part of that, you can also kind of clean up your application. So this was kind of an initial cleanup I did, which you're welcome to kind of go through in your own time, have a look. 
in it now just has the config manager with all that Flask script stuff. We have models, views, and some extra bits and pieces. It looks very Django-y, but I write a lot of Django, so kind of how it happens. Um, how much time do we have? We have nine minutes. Cool. Um, so what we did was very, very, very basic. If you are writing a two or three view app, that's great. There's not a lot of reuse there. Um, there's a lot of other bits and pieces. If your app mostly just needs to be a little web adapter to some much bigger piece of existing work, that would be great. If you want to write a big existing piece of work on Flask, there's more you can do. The first one is something that a lot of people, when they hear this, go, <sighs> which is class-based views. Um, these came from Django. A lot of the Django people don't like them. Um, I'm imagining a lot of the Flask people are also not going to like them. A class-based view is a view that's a class. Um, yeah. So you can see with this one, I want you know a class called whatever. It's a method view, which is just a thing that will pop out some methods for my different kinds of requests. And based on what methods I define will be what kinds of operations I support. Um, there's half a dozen of these built into Flask. You write your own, whatever. The reason these are cool um, and why they're nice in big applications is once I have this, I can override it. I can overload it. I can change it. I can do all that nifty object-oriented stuff. So I can have a generic get um, that goes, OK, load the thing that's in the class variable template. And that's all my base template handling done. Um, and then all I need to do is have a class with a variable called template that inherits from template view. Um, I can also then go, all, all my form handling can be one basic class. All my authentication can be one class. And if you inherit from that, then you'll be authenticated. And we can just implement methods to make stuff happen, return a list of objects, handle a single object, Anything that you want to do, you can then build as a child of some other class. And all that OO stuff can suddenly be applied to web programming. And that's pretty cool. The other thing that you can do is test them much more easily. I can instantiate this class in the regular way. And I can then poke the methods individually in my unit test. So if I have a method that instead of taking in a full-blown request context takes in some data out of the request context. I can test that method in isolation of needing to do a full HTTP request, which is nice for unit testing, makes it a lot faster. Other people just go, what on earth is that? Um, it's really whatever you like. The Django community was like, whichever you prefer. And Flask people, this is quite new for them, but I think they'll come to the same the same place. The other thing is this thing called blueprints. And a blueprint is just a way to create a reusable blob of web app. So there are a couple of these now floating around on the web as little packages. So you can get like an admin blueprint, which gives you an admin site and does then a lot of introspection of the rest of your web app. Um, and so you, instead of creating an app, you create a blueprint. And you kind of then do much the same stuff that you do anyway. Um, it has its own static. It has its own templates. And then you can kind of stitch them all together and create a full application. Um, and even down to things like you can say, when you add this blueprint, add it at this prefix. So here, what might be slash page whatever, some string, um, we can here add a prefix when we go register blueprint simple page prefix equals slash user. And then the URL will pop out at slash user slash page slash some string. And so that's pretty cool for writing bits of code that we can reuse attached to multiple places in our app. If we always need some, some concept of a particular object attached to different parents, we can reuse it. And that will make your app 
much more much more maintainable in the future and just go, why did I do that? Um, so that's all I've got. And I think I've got about four minutes left if anyone else has any questions. Yes? The question is, is it online? The answer is right there. Um, the last letter that you can't see is an E. Yes? Flask is single thread, is it not? No, Flask is however many threads that you need. Um, in, if you're running the dev server, you need to tell it that you want to have multiple threads um, or multiple processes, your choice. Um, so that's a parameter. When you run it in production, it depends on how production is configured. But it is fully thread safe. It will do all the stuff that it's meant to do. Anyone else? Yes. Do you have to swipe up online as well? Yes, they're actually already on GitHub. Um, Is there a JavaScript program? You can't put the lot onto a USB stick, that one in front of you there, perhaps? I Is could as a PDF. Doesn't yes. Matter. Whatever you got, stick it on there if you would, please. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, so I'll add them. They're in a separate repo at the moment. I'll add them as a Git sub module. Of, repo? Uh, that repo is probably Danny slash reveal.js, and it'll be the branch called Flask Tute or something. It's called Reveal.js. Oh, okay. Check it out, it's amazing. <laughs> Big pardon? I saw it for the first time today. It's like third presentation I've seen today to use it. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, the JavaScript thing. It's called Reveal.js. <laughs> cool. Any questions maybe about Python? <laughs> Maybe if I unfull screen that, you'll be able to. Oh no, if I re full screen it, then it works. Cool. Thank you very much. Hi everybody. So what I'd like to do is take you through the process of building a web application uh, almost from scratch. Uh, and this is a chance to kind of share some of the things that I've learned over the past year in doing this to build tools that I've been able to use with my students. So this is the math, the math caching website. It's a cool little thing that you can have your students do. Uh, they go there, they answer some questions, and based on those questions they enter a new URL which takes them to another list of questions and so it's kind of like a, a scavenger hunt through the internet. What I want to do is show you how you can make one of these using just uh, some tools that are freely available um, and I'll show you how you can put those together. Now I am going to show you, I am going to build this uh, piece by piece uh, on the screen so you can see where everything comes from. The only thing that I've pre-built here is this web page, which is going to be a little bit of a demo uh, of what the page might look like. Um, so this right now is just an HTML file that's sitting in the directory, in the project directory that I'm using here, just questions.html. The only other thing in that directory right now is this polygon image, which is what you see here. So the first thing that you want to do is get Bottle. Now Bottle is a web application framework. You can just go to bottlepy.org and go to, uh, this is the site that comes up when you load. You can take a look at some of the stuff that's here, get an idea of what it does, or if you want to just get straight to it, um, I'm going to go to the installation. I'm going to go to uh, PY Place. Um, 
and we're going to download this file right here. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and get that. Go to my downloads, open this up. And what's really kind of neat about this is uh, that it is a single file and nothing more. So all I now need to do is grab this file right here, this bottle.py, and I'm going to throw it into my sites directory where I am doing this project. Let's see here. Here we go. Okay. So I'm just going to throw that bottle py file right here. And so now there are three things in this directory. Um, just this bottle file, the HTML file, and the polygon. So I'm now going to open up Python. I'm using Python 3.2, but you don't have to. You can use one of the earlier versions as well. Uh, and I'm going to make a new file. Now what I'm going to do I'm going to save this right away as uh, mathcache.py. Save that. Um, so now that's another file that's in this directory. So we've added that. And what I'm going to do is import all those functions Uh, from model. I'm also going to add one other thing that you'll find out about a little bit later. I'm going to call this localhost. Um, and that should do it. Um, and I'm also going to put in a command that runs the web server. So we're going to run, I'm going to make the host equal to that variable host. I'm going to put the port at 8080 and I'm going to put debug equal to true. So now, if I run this, we see that it is running a web server on a local host, 8080. Um, so if I want to see what this is creating for me, I go to this URL, localhost8080, I hit enter, and it tells us that it's not found. But this is actually bottle responding, and here's how I know. If I go back to my Python shell, I can see that it has received um, a request at this address. Um, 404 is an HTTP code that means it couldn't find the page and that's exactly what we're seeing here. So let's make it so that uh, we have a page there. So I'm going to make a real quick route. Uh, this tells the web server um, to, to serve a page at a given URL. So I'm just going to call this def main. Um, don't worry too much about this if this doesn't make sense. I'm just showing, uh, showing you how this works. Um, and I'm going to return, this is a test. Save that. I have to reload, the restart the bottle server. Then I go back to this and reload. And you can see, oops, there's still a problem. I see, here we go. I have to put that, no. Oh, this is what I forgot, I forgot the at symbol. Okay, run this again, do this, and now we see our, this is a test. Okay, uh, so that's that. And so we can change that. We can also have it return a template, which is gonna be the key to making our application work. Uh, so, Let's take a look at our HTML file. I'm going to open it with a text editor that I like. Um, and so this is the HTML code for that page uh, that you saw back here. It's this page. Um, three questions, image, little form down here. And this is the HTML code that gives us this. Now, if I want my web server to serve this HTML file as uh, a page at the URL. There are a couple ways that I can do this. One way, and this is the way that we're going to be using in this little tutorial, 
is to make this file a template itself. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna take just the HTML file that's here, and I'm gonna save it as, uh, instead of HTML, questions.tpl. I'm gonna hit save, and I'm gonna go back to my Python file. And I'm gonna return that template, questions.tpl save that and run it and now if I go to localhost 8080 put in that leading slash um, takes a second and it loads that file almost you can see that it's missing the image so what I need to do to add that image is I need to set up one other thing in my file here the problem is if you inspect the source of this web page you see that it says the source is polygon.png. This is the file name that it's looking for. But because this file is coming from the web server, you have to tell the web server where to look for files like this. So to do that, I have to make a function that adds static files. So this is what I'm gonna put in to do this. Um, this is some code that is directly out of the instructions um, that are on the main page for Bob go back here and we look at the documentation um, which is all here let's do a quick search for static not found okay it must be in this tutorial here so if we now search for static do you find it there yes it does okay so if files that um, you just want the web server to serve as is instead of generating HTML from a template they're called static files and Bottle has a really nice way of managing that. Um, ah, here we go. So I've basically taken almost this exact code right here and I've pasted it, into, pasted it into my program. The only difference is I've changed this to be uh, the directory where I, will f where I find um, this web application. So it's gonna look for these static files in this directory. Um, don't worry too much if you're not sure what that means. Um, I run this. We're still going to find that that when we load our program, it hasn't been able to find this. But that's because we have to say in the HTML file where that uh, image is located. So I'm going to add to the image source. I'm going to add static slash polygon dot png. Save that, and now we reload and we have our image there. So we now have our web server, which is, which is giving this particular set of questions when uh, this URL is placed. Now, this probably doesn't impress you that much because this looks the same as what we had before, just with the, the local file, where this was coming directly off of off my computer. Um, so let me really quickly show you how, or, or maybe suggest how this might be a little more powerful. I'm going to add another route. I'm just going to call this test instead. Um, and so I'm going to just make another program. It doesn't actually matter what you name this function. Um, call it main2. I guess that's, I don't know. Well, th let's just go with it. And um, I'm just going to return this is test number two. Um, and so if we run this again, we can see that when we load this page, we get the page we'd expect. If I do forward slash test, I get this other web page. So now I can have all of these, pretty much any website that I want on top of this main domain, uh, just by adding it in that main file. And I want to show you a little bit about, about the power of templates, because right now we're, we're not doing anything very impressive. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the text for each of the questions here, and I'm going to put them in an array uh, or in a list in Python. Um, let me show you what I mean by that. So inside this function where I'm serving that template, um, I'm going to write that question one has the text that's located here. Put 
that in quotes. I'm going to do the same thing for uh, the other two questions. Okay, so that's done. And the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my HTML file. And instead of writing question one, I'm going to use some symbols to tell um, Bottle that I don't want to put this text that was there before. I want to put whatever is inside the variable question one in this space. So these, these double braces are what indicate that. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Make this question two, and we'll make this question three. So that's the first change. So what I'm seeing in this template is that if the web server is going to create a web page, it needs information about what to put here for question one, question two, and question three. Now we have to change things over here. The function returning a template here, returning this template, uh, it's going to return HTML generated by that file. But if I try to run this as is, uh, and I try to load that original address, it's going to complain and it's going to say question one is not defined. The reason it's complaining is that we haven't said in Python, or we haven't told this template what to use, what to put in that space for question one, question two, question three. So that's what I'm going to do here. Question one equals question one, question two equals question two, question three equals question three. Okay, now this right here um, is the statement where I'm saying in this template, we want to use question one um, from this program in the template. This text in that variable, this text in that variable. So now, if I reload, save and reload, and I reload this page, it now gives us exactly the same thing that we started with. Um, but this time, that information is being delivered through these variables. Let me show you why this is really powerful. I'm going to make a second uh, page. I'm just going to copy this over and add in some other uh, questions. So what is uh, 2 times 2? What is 7 minus 3? And what is 1 minus 1? Okay, so we have those three questions. I'm going to change this. Um, I'm going to change this around a little bit. I'm going to make this uh, route show up for page one. And I'm going to make this one page two. All right. Everything else can stay the same thing. I'm going to save that, reload it over here. And I'll reload this, but now I have to add that new address. So page one, there's our file here. But now, if I go to page two, it's going to use that same template, but it's going to use uh, the text that I have given it. Okay, now, um, I'm going to go over to, you notice that it is leaving this image in there, and we don't necessarily want that. So I'm going to go and I'm going to actually take out that part um, where I put in the image. So it appears exactly the same as the others. So we do that. Okay, and now we see our three questions with no image. If we go back to page one and reload it, now we see our three questions. So um, we're going to compress this a little bit. It might be bothering you, excuse me, that we don't see that image yet. We'll get to that just uh, in, in just a few moments. Um, I'm going to show you one more way that we can simplify this process even further. So we're taking these three questions and, and storing them here, sending them along with the template. Um, I can make one big list of these three questions, like so. Um, and now that I've done that, I send just that list of those questions to the template. And what I need to do, and the reason I can do this, um, the reason this is going to work is I have to then go back to the URL and instead say 
that this is going to be the first element in that array, question zero. This is the second element in that array, question one. Uh, and this is going to be the third element in that array, question three, question two. Um, there's a reason why I'm doing this, and you'll see why, again, trying to simplify this template even more as we go along. Uh, so now I save that file. I will save this. And it runs, and we can see, oh, we have a problem. I've not defined question. Oh, that's my problem here. This needs to be questions, because that's what I named it in this file right here, in this uh, line right here. So let's try that one more time. Still complaining, huh? Oh, I need to, let me also do this. Let me put this in the second page, just because I will ultimately need that. Okay, and questions equals questions. Save that. So question zero, questions one, questions two. So let's check this then. Um, save it and run it. Um, reload page one. That's giving us that. Let's reload page two. Okay, so again, there are different questions. Um, so we now have these two separate web, uh, web pages. I'll show you one more thing that we can do now that we have named this um, a single array. We're going to use some of the capabilities of Python to uh, iterate over the questions that are given. Notice that this code is almost the same as this code, which is almost the same as this code here. Um, so what we can do is actually strip this out and do some inline coding using the templating language. So I'm going to do for question in questions. Okay. And what I do here to tell bottle that I am writing some Python is I put the percent sign there first. And what I want it to do is for each question in questions, for each question that's in that array that I pass into the template, I want to have a row. Um, and I want to print the text of that question. Okay. And I have to end that for loop a little bit differently than in regular Python because this is a template. I put the uh, percent symbol and then end. Let's save that. And now if I run this, it looks exactly the same, um, but it's creating this code for each question uh, that I pass it. The really powerful part to this is, let's say I want to get rid of one of these questions. So question three, I'm gonna strip out, I'm gonna strip it out of there, and also here. Um, I save that and run it. It's going to give me the two questions for the second page, but if I go back to page one, it's gonna give me all three uh, so I don't have to write a separate piece of HTML to do this. Okay, now if you're like me, it's probably bothering you still that we don't have that image there. So I'm going to show you how we're going to handle that. Uh, in the template, I want it to make the question look like this if there is no image. And I want, if there is an image associated with a given question, I want to put that image in the page, give it a little bit of space, and then put the question next to it. So inside this for loop, I'm going to add an if statement. Actually, even before I do this, so let's not get ahead of myself. Um, to do this, I'm going to make each question now a list. 
And in that list, it's going to have two things. It's going to have the text of the question, and it's also going to have a location for the image. So for most of these questions that I've made so far, we're not really telling it, uh, we're not giving it an image. There's only one question where that really needs to happen, uh, and that's this middle question here. So let me add this to all of the others. So we'll put this in here. Okay, and let's get to the actual one that matters. So um, inside these quotes, I'm gonna put polygon.png because that's the image that I want it to serve up. Um, this is gonna require that I make a couple changes to my program. Um, I'll show you what that is. I'm gonna save that, go to our HTML file. Now, what I need to do for each question, I want it to have, um, I want it to do one of two things. If, so again, because this is Python, I need the percent symbol, symbol. If question one, that's that second element, is equal to just a blank string, if that is the case, then I want it to do exactly what it did before. It, it makes this row um, and it adds the, the question text in there. If on the other hand, I want it to do something else, which is uh, the way this is going to work. Um, let me also take a moment here to talk about this. Uh, to make things pretty, I'm using a, uh, a library called Bootstrap, which you can, you can add to any HTML file just by adding this style sheet, this line pretty much, uh, to your page. Um, that's, that's where all these, this extra code, you don't need this in HTML to do HTML, um, but it just makes it look really nice. Um, I'll show you what it looks like without it, just so you can see why I'm using it. Um, but I need to add another row. So this is going to be the same. Um, and the first thing I'm gonna do uh, is create a space for the image and create a space for the text itself. This is what I typed to class equals span four. Um, and let me close that div tag just to, to be good. So um, inside this little part of the row, this is where I'm gonna put the image. Um, and the image I'm going to have to put because remember, we're storing this in a variable now. Um, this is gonna be located in question one, that second element of the array, um, which reminds me this up here needs to be question zero because I want the text in that array instead. So this is going to give us the, the location of that, uh, that image. Um, and I'm also gonna add static to that because it's going to grab that image from that address. Um, the other thing that I need to do here is add uh, the other part, and this is where I'm going to put the same code from before, question zero. Because that's going to, so this is gonna put the image in on the left side and the text on the right side. And last thing I need to do is uh, close that row and also end my if statement. So I'm gonna put that end there. So you can see we have a couple things here. We have our if statement, which is gonna decide if we just have text, it's just gonna display the text. If there is an image there, we're going to show the image and the answer text and the, the question text. Um, and then to end that if statement, we put in the percent symbol end. The second end, you might remember, is to close this for statement. So I'm gonna save that and reload this page. And it's given us very interesting bit of info here. Um, Uh, let me just save this and reload it. Let's see if that works. And yeah, that works. Okay, cool. So now it is doing what we expect it to do. If I go to page two, that's that other page with my simple arithmetic, it gives me the questions 
So now this is working exactly as I want it to. Uh, just as a demonstration to show that this, this templating is working, I'm going to switch question uh, 2 and question 3 in order here. I'm going to do that on this page um, and reload that and just show you how easily um, that changes when we load that first page. Um, again, it makes no change except I forgot to switch those question numbers. Um, there is another way to handle that, um, again, using templating, but I'll leave that perhaps as something for you to investigate on your own. Okay, let me show you real quick why I'm including Bootstrap in here. Let me just delete this line um, and reload. Um, I think I need to restart the server for this little demo to work. Um, Oh, I know why, because I'm doing that on the wrong page. So we'll delete this one, save it, and reload. And you can see it's not as nice. It's just Times New Roman text. I mean, it would work. Um, it's, it's not the end of the world. I just really like how Bootstrap makes it just look that much more professional, as if I know what I'm doing here. Um, OK, let's now talk about this location box, because we haven't done anything with it yet. If I, so. Um, let's go to, let's check out this one again. Um, so if I take our questions, um, I should realize now, I'm going to, I'm going to put that third question in there, back in there, um, just because this, this is not consistent. Um, okay, so there's that. Question three, save that. So we're back to having our three questions now. Um, this is where we want our students to be entering the answers. So this says multiply the answers of three questions together and round to the nearest integer. Um, so 4 times 4 is 16 times 0. So we could say 0. Now right now, notice this URL that's coming up when I, when I hit enter. Um, gives us this, this interesting URL that has location equal to 0. And it has a question mark there. When you have the question mark there, it means it's sending a query as part of the request to get a web page. And normally this means it's, it's sending that information to the server in order to help it uh, make a decision about what it shows you. Um, so what we need to do in our program is accommodate the fact that um, it may be getting a location. After all, this is the whole point. We want our students to be searching for things. So the way we do this in Bottle is we write uh, I'm going to make a variable location, and I'm going to set that equal to request.query.location. Um, so this is the request variable that you are sending to the server. This part right here is the name of that variable, which if you look in the HTML file over here, I'm saying that the name of the information that you are submitting when you hit that button is location. Um, just, just to make this clear, let me make, let me rename this new location, uh, and then here, this will be new location. Um, so I'm going to do that. I'm actually going to get rid of these decorated URLs again, or this one in particular, um, and run this. Okay, and now you'll see when I when I load the page, um, it's showing the page that we had before. Um, but up here in the URL, it's including that extra part with the location. So um, I can put anything in here, and it will store that information in this variable new location. I can even put a decimal, uh, and it will go to that location. Whatever you are doing, whatever goes into this field, uh, it is storing in that variable new location. Um, and so this is really powerful because we can now make decisions based on what that location actually is. So uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say if that location variable is equal, remember the double equals is what you use to check to see if two things are equal. If that location is equal to, let's say, a blank, 
um, then I want oops, then I want it to return this. I want it to do all three of these things. So if the location is blank, I want it to give me, I want it to give whoever is loading that web page uh, these three questions. Let's try loading that real quick. Okay, it doesn't like that. Um, let's see, local variable questions reference before assignment. Oh, uh, that's what it doesn't like. So question is equal to this. Okay, so the problem is that it's, okay. So the problem is that it's returning this template the way I had it over here. Um, the location was not equal to the quotes. So it was uh, returning this, not knowing what questions is equal to. I think if I include this as part of that if statement, it should be okay. And let's also include an else. So let's say our starting location is just blank. We want that first page to be where um, our students start. Um, but we wanna say that suppose they are going to a location, they put in a wrong answer. We wanna return um, a template that tells our students that they are lost. Um, so I have a little bit of foresight so I know what I'm doing here and why I'm doing it this way. So I'm gonna return another template that I'm about to make. So if the location is, is blank, I want it to give those three questions. If the question is, if the location is not known that you put in, I want um, a page to come up that says you are lost. You don't know what you're doing. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make that template I'm gonna just uh, take this template file that I've been using for a while. Um, I'm gonna resave it as lost.template and I'm gonna get rid of most of this. Um, I wanna get rid of pretty much all of that. And I wanna say, just in big letters, um, that there are no math questions hidden at that location. Actually, um, I said at the location and I want to store, I want it to print out the location that was put in. So there are no math questions in that location. Location. Go back and check your answers. Okay. And that should do it. Okay. Everything is looking in order there, I think. Um, to reload our server, we haven't done that in a little while. If we need to. Okay, and so now you can see. Let's go back to the main page. Okay, so you can see this is what comes up when the location is blank. Um, so this is what your students will get when they go to the first page. But now I go to location 131 and it tells me, uh, I go to that location, I hit enter and it tells me up oh, there are no math questions hidden location 131. You have to go back and check your answers. Um, so also notice this, this could be if you're doing something maybe using words and you wanna do, uh, one of these questions could be write the first letter of all of your answers. So G H J, go to location and it tells you there are no questions hidden at location G H J. Um, so really, this, this is one limitation, I think, of the original Math Catch page, um, the, the page that I showed you at the very beginning of this video, because those all have to be integers. Um, otherwise, you'll run into trouble trying to get that address. Um, so now we want to we wanna process this. Um, I want this location, uh, this is our first question. I'm going to add in another case, else if location is equal to, and we want this to be the answer to these questions. You know, let me actually, let me change this. What is the sum of the first five whole numbers? Um, and let's put in positive so we don't get into the whole argument about zero. So the first five positive whole numbers. So we know that that answer is going to be 15. Um, and you could include this perhaps as part of, as part of your work. Uh, there are six sides in that polygon, and uh, there are eight prime numbers 
um, between 1 and 20. Um, so our answer is going to be uh, 720. So we now want, if the location is equal to 720, we want to give other questions, our other set of questions. Um, include that colon, paste that in there, and we need to add tabs to all three of those. Oh, that was too far. Okay, uh, so now it's going to deliver this other set of questions. Let's throw that in as well. Um, and so what I'm going to do in each of these cases, so once we have decided what those questions are, we want to return the template with those questions. Let's save that. Okay, and reload. So we can see there are questions. I put in 99. Okay, so there are no questions there. Now let's put in 720. I go to that location, and now it gives me my next set of questions. And so you can imagine that you could do this for a whole bunch of different locations. You could, you could set up um, as many of these pages as you want with different questions. It's all HTML, so if you want to style them somehow, um, you, can, you can do that. Maybe, maybe you want to make um, the question part um, uh, italic. Just tossing this out there is something you might want to do for, for one of your questions. Uh, that didn't work. Um, oh, this brings me to a good point here. If in a template you want it to ignore or you want to it to use um, uh, formatting that you include in your text, all you have to do is include an exclamation point there next to the text. So if you do that, it means it's um, it's going to include, it's going to insert HTML tags that you put in there um, and use them to format. Right now it's doing what's called escaping. It is uh, taking these HTML tags and it's saying, well, I'm going to assume that everything inside this is text that needs to be printed. Um, so if we reload this, now it's interpreting that as just put this as italics. Um, but I'm going to take that out of this here. Okay, and so uh, let's add in one last thing and say, say you want um, to have like a congratulations page. So let's say the answer that they need to get to that congratulations page is uh, zero. Okay, so the final page, the answer that they get to all those questions is zero. Um, let's make one more template. I'm going to take our lost template and I'm going to save it as um, uh, success.tpl. And I'm going to say congratulations. You have reached the end of the quest. Okay, so save that. So if you get to that final location, um, I want to return the template success.tpl. I don't have any variables in there, so I can just leave that um, as is. Run it. So reload this. Um, and let's say whichever page I add, the answer is zero. Put this in. Oh, it doesn't like that, does it? Um, did I reload this? Oh, that's what the problem was. I did not. So now we've got a location zero and it says, congratulations, you're reaching into the quest. So you can make this the, the final thing that you have uh, in, your, in the activity for your students. The last thing that you need to do, that you need to know in order to make this accessible to your students is how to share this URL. You notice right now this is at localhost this is only accessible to uh, my computer. To make this accessible to everybody, um, I'm on a Mac, so I'm, I need to find out what my IP address is. And I can see that it is this. Um, so what I'm going to do is go back to my original code here, 
and in this variable where I put host, I'm going to put my IP address. I save it, reload it, um, and now you can see that it's listening on this address. And if I put that in my um, browser, my first page will pop up. Um, and this should be accessible to anyone on the same Wi-Fi network. Wherever the router is located, um, as long as everyone is on the same router, you should be able to access this. And uh, it may be possible that depending on how your routers are configured in your school that you can access this in multiple locations as well. Uh, but that really depends on how everything has been set up. Uh, with that, I, I hope this has been useful. I will put the, um, the original HTML file up, um, probably on GitHub. Um, but feel free to contact me um, uh, using uh, either my, my uh, YouTube account or through Twitter, uh, which I've put in the information just below the video. Also, just show you, I'll put it here. So it's at EMWDX. That's going to be my, uh, my address. Okay. All right. Thank you for watching. Hope this was useful. Tools in Visual Studio. Python tools in Python Visual tools Studio. In studio of, uh, Visual Studio. Can we have a big round of applause for it? Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we are starting a few minutes late, five minutes late. How are you all doing? Fine? Okay. So, uh, which IDE do you use when you work with Python? Okay. Not IPython, Sublime Text 3? Yeah. So, have you heard of Visual Studio before? Good, at least you've heard. I was assuming nobody would know that even. Anyways, so why am I talking about Python tools for Visual Studio when clearly nobody works on Visual Studio as an editor when it comes to Python? It's because Stack Overflow does annual surveys, annual developer survey, where they talk to around 26,000 people around the world to just profile developers and understand what language are they preferring, what IDE they are preferring, what kind of themes they are preferring, et cetera, et cetera. And some really inter interesting things came out this time. So Python is the third most wanted language in terms of what developers think. Then another statistics is that Python is the sixth, I think, sixth most popular technologies as per developers all around the world. And the desktop operating system that all these developers around the world are working on is Windows 7 followed closely by Windows 8 which is total 53.3% developers. And that kind of got me courage to come and stand over here and talk to you about how you can work on Visual Studio, because at least 50% developers are still on Windows, and Visual Studio is a native ID on Visual Studio. But the good thing is that we have this whole suite of product, uh, tools called Python tools, which are just made for Visual Studios, which converts this Visual Studio into a Python ID. So throughout the next, uh, I don't know how many minutes I will talk, but throughout the next few minutes, I'm going to show you some features that you might find interesting. My name is Samiksha Khare. I work, I'll just give a small introduction to myself. Uh, I work as a technical evangelist with Microsoft Mumbai. I sit out of Mumbai. My job is to work with a, the team that I belong to is a developer relation or developer ecosystem team. So anything that's related to developer and Microsoft, we come into the picture. If you have a feedback that you want to give to the product team, if let's say you're working on a solution and you think that Microsoft can do something to help you uh, expedite that, you can talk to us and we can take your query. For example, last year Star World was making Windows application which needed HLS SDK. And they were making their application on JavaScript. But HLS SDK was available with only C Sharp. So we were in touch with them, and we got the product team to develop the HLS SDK for JavaScript, make the sample codes for them, so that they could do that, uh, make their app on the right time. So sort of my role is a bridge between developers in India to the, uh, to the sort of product team in Redmond, and just general uh, bridge between uh, the developers and what they think about technology, especially Microsoft technologies. You can keep in touch with me via LinkedIn or Twitter. So moving forward, Python tools. It's free and it's open source. So if you feel like after this session that you want to make some contributions, please do feel free to do that. Product team will really love it. Like I said, Visual Studio, if you install Python tools for them, it converts into Python ID. And it has support for CPython, Interpreter, IronPython. It supports IntelliSense, uh, IPython. 
then um, or the, the truckloads of libraries and packages that you can install, normal features like editing, debugging, cross-platform debugging, debugging onto the cloud from Visual Studio, et cetera. And we'll see a demo of all of this. Installation is pretty simple. First of all, if you don't have a Visual Studio installed in your desktop, you will have to install Visual Studio. And if you are a, um, um, if you are a developer, you, can, you should opt for Community Visual Studio 2015, which, is, which has all the features that are required, and it's free. Uh, if you are a startup or a student, you might want to uh, search for BizSpark or a DreamSpark program where you get uh, Visual Studio and other tools for free. If, or you can talk to your employer if you have a MSDN subscription. So downloading Visual Studio is the first step. Second step is that while you're downloading the Visual Studio, you can do a custom download and check mark on the Python tools for Visual Studio. That's one way of getting Python tools. Second way is if you already have a Visual Studio, you can just download the Python tools through GitHub. This entire thing is on GitHub. And you can download the, the interpreter as well. Third thing is that if you already have installed, you can modify the installation and then get the Python tools. So first requirement, Visual Studio. Second, Python tools. Third, Python itself. So you can go to python.org and download the latest version of Python. Or you can download from the distros, like I think there are Anaconda by Continuum, Canopy by Nthought. We recommend downloading Anaconda because that gives you the latest version of the language, and it has a lot of libraries from data and science or something like that. I've not explored it in depth, but um, uh, one guy that I really trust says that this is an amazing stuff. So you might want to check it out. Now let's go to a small demo. And duplicate my screen. I will start by showing you the Visual Studio interface for those of you who are seeing it for the very first time. So this is Visual Studio, where you have a lot of commands at the top. You have an editor on the left, and your project file system on the right. Because I've installed uh, Python tools, I'll show you the kind of templates you can work with. So you can see that uh, I have Python installed. I have a lot of web templates. I have a generic web project, Bottle Framework, Django, Flask, Flask Jade. So you can down, you, these templates come as a part of the tools that you have. If you have installed the sample package of it, then you have a sample application, the polls application on all three frameworks. And finally, there is this standalone project for creating a command line application, which just comes as blank, and you can keep on adding the files as and when. So the, currently, the project that I'm opened is this one, Python application. And I've added one page, module1.py. If I want to add another page, I can go ahead, right click, add, and add new items. OK, let me take it step by step. So this solution explorer, where your project is visible, uh, doc, yeah. So this solution explorer actually displays the files which are very critical to your project. It will not display you automatic generated or any random files. So think of solution explorer files as a file that you will check in in a TFS or any source control, or the critical files that you will give to another developer if they were to start working on your project. So, but if you do want to see the auto-generated files, you can click on show all, which should be somewhere here. OK, there's a show all command somewhere that I can't locate right now, but you can use the show all command. And you can work with that. And you can display all the files which are available. So now you, we have seen template, we, templates which come from Python tools. We have seen the project structure which are there. Let's write, start writing code, because our environment is already ready. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to add another file and add an empty Python file, module2.py. Whenever you start writing code, the first thing, one of the first things you would want to do is import libraries. So for example, if I want to import from any library, I can just write from, and there's a dropdown of all the packages that are available. Um, let's say I want to install or work with a math library. So if I write math, not just the math comes into the picture, but every other package which has math somehow involved with it. So I'll go ahead and write math. The editor itself prompts me to write an import after that. So it's kind of suggesting me what to do next. Then I can go ahead and see what all functions I want. I can go and choose sign. Moving on. So for example, I have just imported sign function uh, from the dropdown of all the functions and methods that were available. If I wanted, if I, write, if I wrote cross, which I did not imp import, 
There's a smart tag, this small blue thing that you can see, this. The smart tag is available that prompts me to import that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and import this. Now I'm imported what I needed. Now I want to write a function. I'll go ahead, find uh, IntelliSense, and insert snippet. Python. I will choose def and then write a function name. Any name I can pick. I can pass a variable and I think I'm good for now. So I'll just move on. I'll not write anything else in this function. I've just written a function name and a variable. Now I'm going to pass some values. These are random dots that I'm writing. Now if I go and define my function, and I just write x, and I hover, you can see that the function already knows the type of x based on the parameters that I have passed. Now I'll write some math functions. smart tag to import radians. And now time to write the main function. Now I will not go to the IntelliSense and then write the entire function. I'll just tab and the function is here. I'll quickly call the function. Now, the editor already knows that the S is string type. It already has figured out that the return type is string, and it kind of gives me completions for it. So you can have uh, is decimal, is digit, a lot of completions that I can take from here. But I'll just go ahead and print it. Press F5. Hopefully, there will be no errors. OK. So now you see that this thing is working out. So this simple editor has a lot of powerful editing commands, which makes your development pretty easy, because it gives you drop downs, completions, uh, understanding the variables as per calls, understanding return type as per the, of the return type of the functions, et cetera. Another thing that I want to show you is a tool called Python Interactive. This Python interactive um, is basically if you want to, if you're working or experimenting with the library and you just want to run a bunch of code quickly and check out the results of it. So you can just go ahead and start writing your code and, and see the results. Um, it's, it's persistent, it's live, it's persistent, which means if I assign a variable to my x or if I assign a value to my x and then use some function, it can retain that value. It has full support for interpreter, which means that if I write multiple lines of code, it should execute. So um, if x is greater than 100, uh, again, I missed the colon, x is greater than 100. Hmm? Ha, colon, sorry. Print yes. Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm very new to Python. I've just started working on it. Let me quickly use this. Right. And it also will help us uh, if, we are if we are working with any libraries. So for example, I'll again write uh, from. It will give me library. Hopefully, if there are sub-libraries, then sub-libraries, then import. And then all the functions of that. So if I'm working with the uh, Azure libraries, then all the functions and classes related to that. 
Another thing that we can do with interactive uh, window is that uh, if you're working on an editor and you want to send a particular code or particular functions into the interactive window just to check out how that function is working out. So you can copy, copy the code that you want to send to the interactive, right click on it and send to interactive. And here I'll call the function make underscore dot underscore string and pass a parameter. What did I do now? Give me one second. OK. Let me try that. Thank you so much. OK. And if I want to edit this function, thanks, it was really that space. And I can change it to sign. And do control enter this time and then call the function. You can see the difference. So any real time change that you want to do, you can keep doing it here. Uh, this, let me open up the environment and tell you that what for each environment, you will have one interactive, so Python environment. So for example, I have Python 3.5 3, 3 and Python 3.4, so each have its own interactive, and you can open as many of them as possible. So we just saw the Visual Studio, Visual Studio projects. We saw Visual Studio editing. We saw Visual Studio interactive window. And uh, this is the environment window where you can open the pip and download or check out what packages are installed. And you can write it here and then install more packages, etc. And we saw the templates which are available. Do you think we can move on? Are you, are you familiar with Visual Studio at, a, at some level now? OK. So I'll go ahead and carry on. So after writing a code, if you are working on an application that requires you to connect to some kind of cloud services, whether it's hosting a web application on the cloud or working with the storage over there, putting, uh, putting up some data or fetching up some data, you would want to have some kind of support in your editor, if that's possible. So what we're doing is that Visual Studio has native support for cloud because I work on Azure. That's what I'm using over here. And that also has a Azure SDK for Python. This SDK has a lot of libraries and a lot of objects that you can work with. Also, it has two emulators, compute and storage, which means as a developer, if you are using Visual Studio as an editor and writing a Python application, that requires you to talk to the Azure cloud services of storage or compute. You don't even have to get out of your editor. You don't have to go to the portal and create website over there and then fetch something and work with that, or create, go to your storage and create containers over there and then upload a picture or a blob over there. You can just be in your local IDE work with the emulators, test everything, and directly then deploy. So this is a, a powerful tool, according to me. And uh, it, like I said, it, SDK gives you client libraries emulator. It can be installed on every, any, any operating system. And installation is very simple, like in one command. Um, let me show you a demo of this. So I've, op I've uh, opened a normal sample bottle web, web project. If I do a F5, if internet is working, I can show the, this project and how this looks. So this is a normal internet is working, thankfully. This is a normal polls application. It asks you three questions, and you can just give your poll for any, any of this. So I can go ahead and vote for it. And I can see the votes into it. Right now, everything is running locally, and I'm still in my IDE. If I wanted to publish it to the cloud, or I publish it to any web application in the cloud, all I have to do is that, download the SDK, of course, download and install the SDK, right click on the project, click on Publish, go on Profile, click Microsoft Azure Web, web Apps, and you'll have to enter your subscription ID. Your subscription will be retrieved. And once that happens, I will not take your time into doing all of that. Your subscription will be de demonstrated over here. And then existing web application comes down over here. Or let me just take a moment and do that. 
you can either create a new app, new web website from over here and then host your application over that or you can just choose an existing website and then host your application over it so it's fetching up my subscription right now and so far i haven't gone to azure management portal i'm still inside my ide okay while it takes time these are the screens basically actually i can did it yes. okay f forget about it probably so this is the second screen that that comes so i've chosen my polls one two three four that's my website you can either create it or then pick like i said uh, second screen you can just go on go ahead and click next Se settings go on and click next and then click on publish as soon as you do that your website is published uh, i'll just go ahead and use the website that i've already deployed using the same steps and because i was dreading internet so much that i've already also opened the website so now you can see the url is azurewebsite.net so again the same poll i can go ahead and open my poll and this time vote for spring and then you can see that the vote count is four which was when we had voted for winter when we were running it locally so now you know that it's the same website which is there so with just one right click you have published your locally running website into the cloud without any hassle of going to the portal making or downloading something or anything else with the power of azure sdk for python and visual studio support there are a couple of more things yes please where are you purchasing the url uh, for the three locally actually on mongodb let me show you that my demo is basically bottle and mongodb i'll take a moment and tell you that if you again go to what i did for this project is that i created a mongodb on azure portal and if i go right click on properties I already have done it. I'm running the already working. So I can show you where I've mentioned the connection string. So I've right clicked my project, clicked on property. So this GUI has opened up. Over here, I have run, run server command and debug server command because I'm in the debug mode right now. And here I've mentioned my repository name MongoDB, MongoDB host, and MongoDB database. It's very simple to connect your website to the MongoDB because you've just mentioned these three things. If you go, if you have experience with Azure or not, go there, create a MongoDB. It takes like five minutes to create that. Bottom app bar, you'll get a connection string. Get the connection string, break it down into host name and uh, uh, host name, repository name, et cetera. Put it over here and you're sorted. And I'll show you in the site, which will assure that it's actually running MongoDB. So I'm in my site right now, my polls one, two, three, four. And if I go about in about, you'll see current repository is MongoDB. And I also got a Rob Mongo to actually show you by going inside MongoDB and showing you the database trees and structure that your actually votes are counting. Unfortunately, although connection and stuff is working, MongoDB is migrating my database to somewhere. All the sandboxed database, if you, if you, whoever is working on MongoDB currently will know that they're migrating. So even if I want to, I can't show you that, but it's actually very simple. Use Rob, Mon Rob, Mom, uh, Rob Mongo to see it inside your database. So for my application, it's getting saved in MongoDB. So this GUI interface of uh, Visual Studio really makes it simple to even connect to whatever database that you want, whether it's MySQL, whether it's Azure Storage, whether it's MongoDB, wh whatever. You, whichever database you are comfortable with, you can work with that. So, so far, when we are talking about Azure SDK, sure. Um, I, I'm not very sure about how charging works because I'm like, um, I'm exactly. So Azure, like you know, is pay as you go, whatever you use, you have to pay. There's a, there's a pricing calculator that you can go to and calculate uh, by virtue of whatever infrastructure or services you're using, what exact amount you will have to pay. But uh, since I'm like a little more technical, so I never paid attention to prices that much. But you can go to Azure documentation, MongoDB, and you'll have all the prices table. So Microsoft that way is very transparent when it comes to charging. So for any services, which are around 45 services in Azure that we currently have distributed into 10 buckets. For any service that you're using or combination of services across this bucket that you're using, you'll have a big table prepared. Usually the pricing, I'll give you an overview of how the pricing works in case you're interested. Usually all these services comes into basic, stan basic shared, standard, and premium sort of levels. Each of these levels have features less or more, cores of VMs less or more, like it's, it's either shared or giving you a complete virtual machine, giving you a complete cluster. And according to whatever is given to you because of that plan, you will be charged like that. 
So I can't give you an exact of how much uh, it's, but you can check it out. I'm sure it's going to be on the internet. So, so far we have seen how to work with, uh, how to deploy a website locally. You know that there are client libraries and you know that there are emulators, storage as well as compute that you can work with. You also know how to connect your website to MongoDB now. There's one more thing that I want to show you when it comes to cloud. If you go to view and open server explorer and your Azure subscription is already been fetched or you'll have to might, might have to enter your credentials, all the services will be listed down here, the services that you might want to interact with or which you already are interacting with. So if app service, the web apps is a part of app service. If I open, I can just see it over here, uh, how, what is the status of my service? Is it, if the website running, not running? If I'm working with storage, I can open the storage. Let it refresh, it might take a couple of minutes based on how inter what internet I have. And you can see my poll, actually so this is, this one should have my poll one, two, three, four. So if I right click, I can refresh, view in browser, view settings, attach debuggers, which will come to when we talk about debugging. You can stop the website, you can open it, manage a lot of other things that you can do. Same way with the storage, you have all of this uh, storage which are available, blobs, queues, tables. So if, you are imp if you're working on some code and then you're putting some data, you, just, you can open the blob from over here and see. So it's basically sort of a window to talk to Azure services from Visual Studio. I think this is all I wanted to talk about when the cloud connection is concerned. Let's move on. Debugging. It, it, only for one slide I'll have to sort of show you my slide. I'll just take you to demo again. There are a lot of debugging options which are available in Visual Studio. So there's general debugging like stepping in, stepping over, stepping out that are available. General editor, right click debug. Class platform debugging which is available and uh, debugging this website that we have just hosted on Azure web apps. So I'll just directly take you to demos because I think those will be more interesting than theory. So what I'll do is share my screen first. Okay, so what is this print screen? Never mind. I'll open up any project. Uh, Python application 4 should be fine. Or let me open, okay, fine, this one. So if this is my, this is the dot, the bouncing dot uh, code or script that we just saw. You can debug and you can step into it it's, it's just like F5, just that it, pa it pauses on each of the statements. And then here's an autos window that gives you a view of uh, local variables. Local, which will have the name and the value of all the variables. And a watch where you can write any code and then check it out. So our uh, write any, any Python expression, you can write any Python expression in the watch window and see it moving or see it performing some actions as per your code starts getting debugged. So these are the three windows. So even if I move a lot, you can see this O moving because I'm working with the function. And over here, there's a call stack which gives you the functions and which functions are working or uh, which functions are uh, working right now, which lines we are working. So all of this information are in the call stack. You can also put a breakpoint somewhere and uh, see the values of the uh, see the values of the variables. For example, I'm here and i value is six. I can change the value of six to seventy. Move on. Then I can still do f11, f11. I'm still working with prints and s is a string, and it should prompt me <coughs> for more options because s is a string. Since it uh, the i the i variable is int, and we just changed it live runtime. And s is a string, so it, if it has to offer something, it let it come. I will hover. I will see. Yeah. So based on what your input or the string is, there is a XML visualizer, HTML visualizer, JSON visualizer, or text visualizer. So, so while you're debugging, you have a lot of option to play around with as per the type of your uh, variables. This is one way to debug. Then second thing that you can do is you can directly right click on your editor and then go ahead with start with debugging. 
if you're just debugging and there are no errors, that's fine. But if there are errors and you then start debugging, Okay, it should break, and it's breaking because I've reduced one space here. So basically, when you right click and do start with, with or without debugging, whether you are working with step in, step over, or step out, it breaks as if you have put a breakpoint if there are any unhandled expressions in the code. And if there are not any unhandled, unhandled expressions, it will debug in a very, very normal manner. So these are the two things that I wanted to talk about. Now the third thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of debugging was that, Let's say uh, you're working with Visual Studio, which is on Windows platform. And then there is some script that you are running on a Linux machine or a Mac machine. And you want to debug this script, which is running on either Linux or Mac, through your Visual Studio tool. So it will be a cross-platform debugging that you can do using Visual Studio uh, Python tools for Visual Studio. So what I've done is that I have created a, a virtual machine, the VM of, uh, sorry, Linux virtual machine. And I am going to connect to this Linux virtual machine using Putty, and then attach to the process where my script is going to work out. So let's take a look at how that is done. So this is, again, a normal one-page Python script that I picked up from Python Wiki. It's a very simple program. It asks me to enter my name. After that, it asks me to take a guess of number from between 1 to 20. If I have entered a number which is less than the number which is randomly fetched, it will prompt me that your guess is too low, which is sort of a hint. And then again prompt me to enter a number. If I enter a number which is very high than the number, the current number, the random number which has been picked, it will tell me that the guess is too low. If I have guessed it correctly, it prompts me a message saying good job. And if it's not, if it's, it's a wrong guess, then it tells me that, that it's, a, it's a bad message. So what we'll do right now is we'll connect to, so I, I made a video out of this, but I want to do it here. So I'll try. If not, then I'll show you the video. So I'm going to enter the name of my virtual machine, or the host name or the IP address, and click open. Meanwhile, I'll take you to my Azure portal and show you that which virtual machine we are working with. I have logged in on my putty and entered a username. It should ask me for a password now. So right now, I'm logging into my virtual machine, which I've hosted on Azure. And I've logged in successfully right now. I can do a vim command, go inside my uh, module1.py, the file in which I'm running. And I can change it or sort of change the code. Or I can just go ahead and I think this code is perfect. So I'll just go ahead and. OK, hang on. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah, WQ. Thank you. After that, I'll just run my module. And right now, the same code is running in, in my Linux virtual machine. So I'll just enter my name. It asks me to take a guess. So I'll pick any random number. And it's saying your guess is too low. Now, if I want to debug this code to get to know which is the number that they have picked and not get a guess wrong, I'll start debugging my code. So I've put the same script on my Visual Studio editor. I'll put a breakpoint into the statement on line number 14 where the numbers are actually increasing. I'll debug attached to the process. So now what I'm going to do is that attach a debugger to the same process where the script is running on my Linux virtual machine. And then I have to put a qualifier to attach. So I'll put a secret that I have created in my script. And I'll hit refresh. What it is doing right now is that it has picked up the, uh, the secret. It knows my Linux, the host name of my virtual machine, is going to fetch a process on which the script is running. 
So, let us give it a moment. Okay, let me try again. Usually, it does not take so much of time, it happens really, really quickly, but then it depends on the internet connection and everything else. Okay, I think I should rather show you the video. Is it my movie or video? Okay. So, we have seen the process till here. I will hold on over here. So, as soon as you enter your uh, qualified statement and choose Python remote debugger, it shows you the process in which the script is running. As soon as you hit refresh, that is where I was not able to get through, so, so the video. And then you just click on attach over there and it is as simple as that. You have now attached a debugger to a virtual Linux virtual machine running on the cloud. If you go ahead, let me take you to the part. Uh -huh. As soon as the attach happens and you enter another guess, two windows opens up. So, there is one autos window that will have your guesses and the number of guesses that you have made. So, for example, if I have written 6 and my number of guesses 1 and over here is a Python debugger interact where you can use commands and do whatever you want. So, the in, in the actual demo had it worked, what I, have, I would have shown you is that I would have converted my number which is 6 into the real number which they are searching and then use, the, use that use, using this debugger eliminated my wrong guesses and then to it, it would have shown me that your guess is correct. So, this is essentially going to do, do just that. So, I will pause here and re reiterate what we have just seen in terms of debugger. Yeah. So, quickly just like 5 more minutes. So, what we have seen is that uh, normal debugging happens through the autos window, the watch list window, stack window and you can check out the local variables over there and the methods that are doing that call. You can step in to see and pause at each of the step and use F11 to go on. You can also uh, step over and step to the end while using the step in. You can uh, debug without, uh, you can also run your code without a debugger, in which case your code will run faster. You can associate, uh, attach a debugger to a remote or a, a different uh, cross platform machine, whether it is Linux or Mac, whether it is running on premise or on the cloud, and debug that in like very, very simple steps. And I just showed you that here the network is not even that strong. So it is fairly easy. If you have a decent network, you should be able to do that. One last quick thing that I want to show you is how to attach a debugger to a uh, website which is running on the cloud. So, I will go back to my bottle website that we have that we've just seen previously or actually this time let me take you to Django. Django also I have published on Azure. So, let me see if I have already opened it for you. Yeah. So, it is Django web world dot Azure website dot net. Any website that you are working with on Azure backslash write pt what is that ptvsd that is all you have to do. If you do that, you will get a string which asks, which, which is the same string that we have applied when we were doing the cross platform debugging, except that use TCP protocol. You have to copy this string, go to your source code, debug, attach a process, choose Python remote paste. Now, one quick thing in our uh, cross platform script, I had defined a secret which was PyCon. In this case, when I am using a template, where have I defined my secret? Because without secret, you cannot attach to a process. So, what Python tools for Visual Studio does is that when you try to attach a process, it auto generates a file called web.config, web.debug.config. In that web.config, first of all, you will not be able to see it if you are just working with Visual Studio for the first time because it is an auto generated file. And I mentioned at the very beginning that your project only shows you critical file. So, you will have to find a show all button and then you will be able to see the web.config file. Go to your web.config file. I will do cancel. Here is my web.config. And here I can see that there is a secret mentioned. Copy the secret, paste it on the debugger, and you can attach the debugger like that. After that, it will work similar. You can put breakpoints, you can do F12, 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 whatever you want to do, you can do that. So, how many more minutes? Two more minutes. No, two more minutes. Ha, I'll take that. Uh, just a couple of more things that I wanted to show is that Visual Studio also have a support for source control. So, without going to the PowerPoint presentation, I will quickly take you to any of these projects and go to Team Explorer. As soon as I do that and make a new connection, I can 
choose a new connection, I can add a new, uh, I can you add a new repository, I can clone a repository. So for example, you're working with some repository on GitHub and you want to branch it and do your own code and then put it back and sync it. All of this can be done from inside the inside Visual Studio. So just go ahead, paste your uh, 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 the URL of the repository that you want to clone and then clone it over here. I have cloned a lot of repositories, but I'll go ahead with Azure SDK. I can quick click on branch. I can create a new branch over here. Okay, let me go back to, anyways, so you get the feeling, right? You can go ahead, click the new branch. Um, I'll go over here, go back to my solution explorer. And here is my solution explorer, where I've branched my repository. Once all of that is done, I can just click few few more clicks and I can do a committed change into the repository. One more quick thing that I wanted to tell you was that um, Visual Python tools for Visual Studio has full support for IPython, and I think that works with uh, yeah full support for IPython. So I just had one PPT that I wanted to show, one slide one slider on that, and with that it's an overview of Python tools for Visual Studio that I, that you have seen. You've seen editing, you've seen debugging, you've seen how it works with cloud, you've seen that it can co integrate with source control, not just GitHub. It can also works with Visual Studio Team Foundation Server if you have ever worked with that. There are a lot of deep dive tutorials and videos that are available if you'd like to sort of work with them. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me or my teammates or any of the product guys from the GitHub repository. And if you'd like to contribute, we'll be more than happy if you did that. So uh, this is all from my side. And now you, I can take questions if you have any. Any other questions? Yes, please. Thank you. You just mentioned that uh, we need a Linux VM to operate the thing you showed us. Ha, cross, cross but, platform uh, as you mentioned as you mentioned RunSpark, that doesn't give ac access to vms in microsoft azure but gives access to web portals for okay, free okay okay so do we need the linux vms in order to no, deploy no. this what i was trying to show you is that uh, there's a feature which makes it possible for you to do a cross platform debugging so i chose linux virtual machine on the cloud because i don't have a linux virtual machine in my hand or a mac virtual machine for that or mac machine for that matter so if you come across a situation where you have to work on two different platforms, at that time you already have it. Otherwise, you just know that it's a feature. Use it when you need it. No, it actually, for us like students, we have the free access to an Azure web port, Azure website deployment that service as we get it for free. Right. But without the VM, so can we just? So the thing is, the person, whoever makes the Stream Spark program, I can tell him that there is a request from students that uh, the VM should be included in the package. Exactly. But uh, so that's all I At can do. At least the do basic uh, tire should be included. That's true. Yeah. Sure. I can take it back, and you, if you want, you can just tweet to their handle. Find out people who do Redeem Spark. Because and tell um, them. one thing I'd like to share, uh, just uh, one minute. Sure. Sure. Go uh, ahead. Website Spark was a program before that gave Visual Studio Professional with MSDN that mm -hmm. uh, access to fifty dollar credits per month. $50? That has been uh, withdrawn recently. Withdrawn? Oh, yeah. OK. So that's the problem. We don't get access to the VMs. Oh, OK. But did you get a chance to work with VMs? Yeah, you already have that uh, uh, that $50 credit. I still get the credit. But uh, I'm thinking of apartment finds. That's yeah, it. Yeah, sure. Yes, sir, Thank please. You. Yeah, you sample so of our so websites. Uh, so, sorry. Okay. It, it, uh, do you have any uh, sample websites uh, built out of this uh, Python tools for the Visual Studio? Sample Something like a, a Contoso samples are there from Microsoft. So, sir, if, uh, the, like the one that I was working with, the Polls website, that's the one that I know of. I can look for more, but if you want to try out that uh, website that I've said, just go ahead and write my polls 1234azurecloud.com. Yeah, no, no, no. That's all. Yeah, you can try that out. Now how about the source code and uh, things are available? Yes, sir. So you can go to GitHub and write PTVS, which is Python Tools for Visual Studio. Okay. There's an entire documentation, video series, step-by-step -step tutorials, and even I'm going to start blogging now. So whatever I have shown you right now, I am going to put it on my personal blog too. So I think you are covered from that. So honestly speaking, when I was working with, uh, when I was looking at the resource, I thought they were they can be a little bit more detailed. So there were a lot of bunch of us who have started working on it. And if you work on it, I would also encourage you to write your own uh, documents for that. But they're available. Everything is available. So anybody has any more questions? Okay. Yes, please. Yes, yes. You can go to youtube.com and um, what is that? Uh, type connect and uh, just search connect and PTVS. So uh, oh, you know about Microsoft Virtual Academy. That's so nice to hear in a PyCon. <laughs> Oh, awesome. <laughs>
<laughs> I was starting to feel identity uh, crisis here. <laughs> no, MVP. Oh my God, awesome. For those of you who do not know what an MVP is that, MVPs are the most valued professional from Microsoft platform. And even so, this time, uh, there is this um, meetup happening in Redmond for MVP. Are you still an MVP? I'm just curious. No, you should. Once okay, yeah, so it's like happening again. No, no, one minute. Um, I'm not sure if there are videos um, on Microsoft Virtual Academy, but uh, what you might want to check out is YouTube. There's a Connect series somewhere, which a Microsoft Redmond guy has started making, where there are two kinds of videos, a short video that introduce you to the features, and a deep dive video that take you deep dive into the features. I think all you will need to do is go to GitHub and go to PTVS repository. That is your one-stop shop for everything you will ever need to know when it comes to Python tools. Also, two quick pointer or two, two quick uh, last-minute notes. There are also Python tools for Windows IoT. There are also Python tools for UWP. UWP is my Windows 10 application apps platform. So there are a ton of work which is happening. There are a ton of work which has already happened. So if you, if you want, you can just go ahead and check it out. And do let us know if there are any feedback. And we'll be happy okay. to. And it's open source, so you can contribute to or change so or fix the issues. You should have a big round of applause for ma'am. Thank you, sir. Don't call me ma'am. And uh, we have a small gift for ma'am from the whole team I'm of PyCon India. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. What's in it? Okay, okay, thank you. I had actually gotten pen drives for people who were asking me questions. Unfortunately, it's in my, it's, I left it because I was worried about the internet and stuff. But please do come, people who have asked me questions, to the Microsoft booth after this or whenever you get time and collect your pen drives. And thank you so much for listening to it. I wasn't expecting a lot of people in the session which talked about Visual Studio, but it was very encouraging to see your res uh, response and questions especially. So thanks. Okay, uh, there is an announcement. Uh, there is one uh, hotel key which has been found uh, in Auditorium 1. So if it is your key, then you should go to registration desk and uh, take it. Thank you. Some announcement first. Uh, we have uh, the bags, laptop bags are available at the registration counter for uh, 1200 rupees. And uh, the t-shirts for PyCon India will be uh, distributed at 1230 at the same place. And uh, for open space talks, uh, there are two slots still available. You can register in the main lobby. And uh, also, th uh, there are uh, you can register for lightning talks as well. And uh, yeah, today we have uh, with us uh, Indra Dhanush Gupta. Uh, and the talk is Avoiding Common Pitfalls of Dead Time from a Web Apps Perspective. Hi. Uh, I'm audible, right? B at the back? OK. Uh, thanks for coming up. So yeah, like. Uh, he said, uh, it's about avoiding common pitfalls of date time. So basically, uh, this talk is going to cover off the difficulties we generally face when we are working with date time objects, OK? So the target audience, beginners in Python. Why beginners? Because date time to beginners is like an uh, opaque ball. Like you cannot see inside it. You don't really understand what going inside it and you're actually very scared of it like i was very scared of date time when i was uh, starting with python web developers you build a website you need a date time right like it's one of those things like uh, when we were young parents and teachers used to say like kahi bhi jao you need maths right so it's like that like in programming kahi bhi jao you need date time and uh, basically anyone else so uh, why this talk Date time is heavily used, right? Like I said, and uh, again, like it's not obvious from the beginning where could you go wrong, right? Like uh, when you work, starting to work with date time, you don't really realize that you are actually making a mistake. You only come to understand that you are make, maybe making a mistake when you have some real data in your hands, and then some guy is complaining, "Hey, like this is not working for me or what?" And uh, basically, I'll be sharing my own experience. Like this is stuff that I just learned after failing myself, like where are things that could go wrong? Just about fixing those stuff, okay? So, uh, date time, right? That's the, uh, it's shipped with the standard library in Python. Uh, few terminologies before I begin, really. So naive versus aware. Uh, so naive date time is an object that doesn't really have a time zone info with it, right? Like time zone as in uh, Indian Standard Time, UTC, whatever. So let's just take a look. Like, if you take at the first line over here, right? 
uh, from date time import date time. So, if I print this uh, naive date time over here, you can see that it specifies right down to the micro uh, second resolution, right? But it does not really give you an information as in like what time zone it is. It is it's exactly equivalent to like say I uh, call you up one fine morning and tell you, uh, hey, it is 12 o'clock where I am. Now, tell me where I am. It does not make sense, right? Like I could be anywhere. I could be in India. I could be in uh, Australia. I could be in US. So, basically, you should always be attempting to use date times with time zone. Like if I call you up and tell you that, Hey, it's 12 o'clock in IST. So you would know that even if you are in the US, you can basically uh, use the time zone conversion to find out like, okay, then what's the equivalent time in my, right? Uh, you can just like, if you need an aware time zone, uh, aware date time object, like all you have to do is uh, pass the time zone to it, right? I'll come back to it in a while. So if you take a look right at the right corner, uh, it has a plus 0, 0, right, which indicates it is in UTC. Okay. Um, date time storage in Postgres. So, we, when we are building a website, right, you cannot really live without a database, okay. And my talk is basically centered around a web app, the difficulties you face when you are building out on your uh, web app, okay. So, and my, in my uh, demo, I will be using Postgres. So, okay, so this is the Postgres shell of my uh, demo app that I have created, okay. And uh, in my demo app, all that I have is, uh, I have a table, okay, this is not, uh, yeah, okay. I have a table that uh, is named access keys, okay. Um, so, so what this basically does is, it is telling you what the current time zone is for Postgres itself, okay. So when I do show time zone, Postgres is telling you, ki boss, I am configured to use UTC. Well, you can change this. Um, actually, before that, let us see this. So uh, what I am basically doing over here is, I am just uh, displaying the one of the date time fields that I have in my database, okay. So if you just take a look, uh, no need to look at all this gibberish, like just take a look at the plus zero zero, right. And maybe if you want to look at the first column, so it's like 1735 at plus zero zero. Actually, let's zoom out a bit. Sorry about this. Uh, so, what you can do as well is you can tell Postgres, ki, dude, I'm living in India. I don't want to see uh, daytime in UTC. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. So, what you can basically do is you can configure Postgres to use any other date time, uh, any other time zone. My bad. Okay, so what I am configuring here is basically to use the um, Indian Standard Time Zone. Okay, and when I display all the uh, created ad attributes, you can see that if you remember, it was 17 something, right? 1700 hours. So it's 23 plus 530. So it's basically converted into IST. But important thing to note over here is Postgres is always going to store your data in UTC. I mean, that's the default standard, right? Like whatever time zone you are. It stores it into UTC, whatever time zone you need, it will return you, convert it uh, into that time zone and return you that object, okay? Okay, should I ever use a naive date time object? Well, to be honest, no, never. Uh, frankly, when you give someone a naive date time object, it actually makes their life very difficult because they have no clue what moment in time you intended, right? So you guys must be knowing about epoch, right? Uh, how many know about epoch? Okay. So epoch is basically uh, 1970, first Jan 1970, okay? And date times are measured in seconds since that point of time. So we measured that, so we name it as epoch. And uh, so any date time is, sorry? Okay. Uh, any date time is basically seconds since 1970, first Jan, okay? So, any date time aware uh, object is actually representing a specific moment in time, right? Doesn't matter if it's in US, UTC, if it's in IST, if you have the time zone information available with it, you can uh, basically derive the, a meaningful uh, relationship out of it. Okay, 
pi tz right like in one of the slides uh, you saw something called pi tz dot utc so pi tz is a third party library uh, which is actually i found out to be very uh, handy as in so there are many uh, more than a couple of actually third party libraries so pi tz is something i found out to be very handy because um, i'll show you so even though i'm telling you to use an aware date time object not always will you have a time zone aware object right let's say you are taking input from a user now of course you don't expect a user to enter plus 05 colon 30 right so you have you'll maybe use their ip address or whatever right to determine the time zone but you still have a naive date time object so at times you will have to add time zone information to a naive date time object okay so to do that basically okay this is the naive date time object that we have from one of the previous slides right now this is ist so what i am basically creating is i am creating a time zone instance so that i can add it to a naive date time object so basically all you have to do is uh, ist so in uh, right here right you can see that i have a ist date time object all you have to do is do ist dot localize and basically attach the naive date time object so what you are effectively doing is adding time zone information to a naive date time object so if you take a look at the output at the bottom of the screen like just compare the one one at the top and the one at the bottom the time is still the same that's what i said right like if you don't have a time zone uh, information i cannot do any conversion the best i can do is add a time zone so if i still add utc into this it's going to be 00 um converting date time to another time zone uh your users will be in india and you will be in utc right so the problem over here is that you cannot show a guy living in the us a time respective in the in india right doesn't make any sense to them so all you have to basically do over here is do you have an aware date time object right all you can do is like do an as time zone and insert the time zone information and what happens is you can convert the uh, object into the relevant time zone i'm running a bit short on time i'll just uh, skip a little uh, do not use date time replace so one thing over here is uh, why not use replace so you can actually replace the time zone information in an object by directly calling uh, the dot replace method so let's take a look i have a utc object over here and um, basically i can do a utc dot replace and tz info is equal to ist right now if you note over here like look at the right hand bottom screen the offset says as 0553 now we know I, ist is 530 right like isn't that incorrect or something well not exactly i'll tell you why and the offset of course is 5 hours 53 minutes right so let's try the uh, let's try the method that i showed so what i am doing over here is I, i have a intelligent date time i'm creating it using utc now dot as time zone so if you take a look at plus 530 so you have plus 530 at the end right so the problem over here is that uh, back in the 1900s the time offset from utc was 5 hours and 53 minutes now dot replace doesn't know about this okay so if you have a date time object in uh, 1900s as time zone is going to apply the time offset to 5 hours and 53 minutes and if you have a date time object more recent like 2015 the offset is going to apply is 530 uh so like in the 1945 if i'm correct uh, we were india was also using daylight saving time okay and so the offset over there will be plus 630 so it's so you don't know what the what time the user is going to give you in, right so you have to uh, handle the use cases accordingly there you go like uh, you have the utc offset um right so if i use an old date over here just take a look at, at number 12 right here um uh, old date is something in 1900s right and when i convert it using as time zone the offset is 553 uh okay so some examples from production right so if you take a look at this pic over here basically what i've been talking for the last 15 20 minutes right guy is sitting in india he uploads at 530 
your database should be storing it in UTC. Guy sitting in US at PST, he can read it at 5 a.m. PST. Like he says, okay, this guy uploaded just now. Like if he's awake at 5 a.m., okay, this guy just uploaded that uh, right now, right? So if at UTC 5:30, the equivalent time if it is 5:30 p.m., if the time is 5:30 p.m. in IST, in UTC it is 12 p.m. and uh, in uh, PST basically UTC minus seven, that's 5 a.m. So now you know like why you should be always using uh, UTC itself, right? Because it's a standard common point where everything comes and converts into UTC and anything that goes out, you can like basically convert into uh, respective formats. Freeze gun. So a lot of times you'll have to be testing code, right? Uh, which is dependent on uh, daytime objects. Now, an example, let's say you have uh, access tokens, right? Like in APIs, we have access tokens, which you want to expire, let's say, you want to expire access tokens older than 30 days, right? Now, you need to write tests for this. Now, obviously, you can't run a test for 30 days, like start the test, wait for 30 days to pass, and then try to uh, call your method that deletes it, and see that if it is actually deleting it or not, right? Not very feasible. So, what you should be doing is, you use freeze time. What it does is, uh, so if you take a look, we can use it as a context manager, and so basically, what it does is patches onto the daytime library. So it, what it's doing is when you call daytime dot now, it's printing 2010-01, right? First January of 2010. So what freeze time does for you is it overrides the default value of daytime dot now. You can also use it as a decorator over methods, right? Like the same thing, right? And uh, decorator over class as well. Uh, the example that I was talking about, right? Now, I generally don't want to put, out, put in a lot of uh, code into this, but this is something I couldn't really av avoid. Okay, so what I'm basically doing is over here, I am taking my limit as uh, I'm going back 30 days from today's date. Like what if today is 4th of October, I'm going 30 days back. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking out all access key objects from the database uh, that are older than 30 days, okay? So, and what I'm doing is basically marking them as expired. So I, so now th that is your, uh, now this is the method that you want to test, right? And how to write tests for it? If you have a Django test case like this, now I want to create an access uh, key object that is, that was created, let's say, uh, 30 days back, right? Like about uh, 4th or 5th September, right? So what I do is I uh, freeze time, right? As a, uh, 1st January of 2015. So what I do is, so when I do objects.create, now Django has this uh, uh, utility, like daytime objects can be initialized as the current time. So the current time in your system right now is going to be 2015, 1st January. You cannot escape it, like inside the first with block. So if you come to the second with block, what I'm basically doing is I'm changing the time to 31st January, okay? So now what I can do is I can create, I call the same uh, create call again, right? And now the created at time is going to be 31st January. So basically at like in one test, I have two objects that were created apart, 30 days apart, right? And if you like uh, run an assert equal on this, like I can check that uh, there are two instances, right? And then what I'm doing is I'm basically calling the method that I've defined above, right? And uh, so once it's done, all I'm asserting is if live keys are equal to one, like what I'm doing is I'm just checking out if it actually did pass the test, right? Um, and it would work. Uh, how much time do we have? Sorry? 18 minutes I have? Okay, oh, that's a lot of time. It's fine. So, date time dot time delta. Uh, so, these are some stuff that you should be generally using in a lot of places, like, um, Let's say your user wants all records in the last 30 days, right? Now, this is very tricky. 1st January to 30th January is very easy. What about uh, 15 July to 15th uh, of, uh, from 15 July to the last 30 days, right? I don't even remember if uh, June has 31 days or June has 30 days. Nor do you need, nor do I have to write the logic to parse out if it has 30 days or not. To make matters worse, across leap years, right? Um, if I want to check uh, in the last six months and 2014 and 2015, if one of them is a leap year, how do you do it? So you do it with time delta. 
what time delta is basically is basically it's a difference between two times in uh, seconds but the library basically gives you some added information on uh, like uh, what's the difference so what i have here is basically a date object which is uh, 3rd october and so if i go back, want to go back by two weeks what i have to do is date minus time delta weeks of 2 so what it does is so it's roughly the same right like uh, so this library handles the intricate details for you so you should really be using time delta a lot more often you can even go back uh, in days and uh, it also gives you resolution up to uh, hours minutes seconds and right down to microseconds but if i want to go back by years and months right that is not something that uh, time delta provides you so we have a relative delta and actually it's a third party library date utils um, so what it does is does for you is again i have another date object um, right so what you can see is all i am passing it here is ki boss take me back in time by 2 years and 6 months and it's going to do exactly that like it's going to handle if there's a leap year or not if there was any uh, whatever uh, if there was any uh, odd uh, difference in time if there was a leap second or not it's going to just handle it for you a lot of times you will also be getting input from the user like the user is entering the time in the browser right and you don't really have a python object at the browser level correct so when i'm i have it as a string now it gets very difficult to convert it into a date time object i mean it could be very uh, error prone so what i use is date util dot parser what it does for you is it handles all the different formats so you can see here right like i send it a string in 2015 11 it's going to return you a date uh, object date time object but again you didn't pass it any time zone so it's not going to attach any time zone to it if you pass it 2015 it's going to assume by default that you're talking about 1st january i'm sorry it's talk you're talking about the correct current date on uh, uh, your system right like if today is 4th october which it is actually so if you just pass it 2015 it's going to add the uh, date and month to it well you can actually uh, pass it uh, time zone information as well and you can also like pass it different time zones just the same example in utc okay we come back down are you done yeah i think yeah i'm done so that's it uh questions Sorry. How do, yeah. you, how do you um, make it um, um, accept, um, make parser access only valid uh, date time? Right. Even if I enter a new so one, parser, one, it will pass that. Sorry, if you. I notice that even if you enter a numeric one. Correct. It will, it will pass it as uh, maybe one or zero or something. Will it? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I actually don't know what the output of uh, one will be, but if you enter, let's say, uh, hello world, right, it's going to raise an exception like uh, invalid format yeah, of course. yeah so you have to handle that in your code right like exceptions are something you have to handle yeah, yeah. okay yeah. parser is basically for converting strings to date time objects not the other way around if you want to convert date time to string you need to be using a uh, strf time basically string format time you can actually use strip time in case of parser as well but over there you'll have to enter the formats like like percent y percent m but honestly i have the time i'm confused if percent m capital is for month or percent m capital is for minutes so it's again very confusing so but parser uh, handles it all for you you want to throw an error yeah. if the guy enters 2015 um i guess you'll have to do it yourself like that's a library it's a library feature right like that's a good thing so if you want to go around it i guess you'll have to do You'll have to check if it's uh, only the year has been passed or not. Like you have to manually check if the check. correct. Okay. 
uh, in Django, mm -hmm. uh, we use the daytime fields and we give a default value. There are two options we can give. One, we can give default equal to daytime dot now. Right. Or we can give Django's utils times out dot now. Okay. And is there any, uh, what is actually doing the difference between these two methods? Uh, can you tell me about the second one? Uh, time zone dot now. Time zone now dot now. Mm. Time zone dot now. Yeah. Okay. Django dot utils. Um, so in Django dot utils dot time zone dot now. Yes. I haven't actually used it. So what I do in daytime objects for Django is uh, Django gives you two uh, args. Like you can pass uh, auto now equal to true, and you can pass auto now add equal to true. What it means is when you pass auto now equal to true, that is every time the object is updated or even created, it's going to update that field, right? So it's very useful for fields like updated at. So you don't have to manually enter, get the date time dot now and do an update. So what you can do is like you have updated at as a date time object and you can pass created at equal to true. The other thing you have is, uh, sorry, uh, auto now equal to tree, true. The other thing we have is auto now underscore add equal to true. When you do that, what happens is it will only put the current time when you are creating that instance. So it's, so you have uh, very easily, you have created at and updated at. Okay, in uh, Django's time zone settings file, uh, in settings.py, you have this uh, settings, uh, time zone settings. Right. You give, uh, there is options like uh, giving the uh, time zone address UTC, right. Rishai, Kolkata. Right. Right. And we give uh, the same uh, use TZ equal to true. Right. And when we give uh, UTC and we are running a program, and actually uh, when we are uh, using uh, testing, we will give we will get the time object as UTC mostly. Okay. But uh, for checking, uh, we use the uh, to get our own time zone. We use we give Asia Kolkata instead of UTC. Uh, come again. Uh, to get the time zone value of our current uh, India, you mm -hmm. we give replace the UTC with Asia Kolkata. Okay. Okay. But when uh, we we want our website to continue production, it it is accessed through the countries, and how Django is actually may uh, deciding uh, which time zone to use because time zone is uh, given right at the settings. Right. So what you have is so in your settings when you define the time zone, that's the default time zone that Django is going to use until and unless you specify explicitly. So if you're fetching a instance, a created at instance from the DB, it's going, so if you've set the uh, time zone setting as UTC, it's going to return you it in UTC. If you've given it as Asia Kolkata, it will return you it in Asia Kolkata, okay? But internally, like for Postgres at least, it's always stores in UTC by default. Hi, uh, Hi. this is Gaurav here. So I just want to know, like in if if in our data database, so the value is stored in UTC, the date time, and in my website I want to show that time. So I want to show that time on the current zone. So like if I'm in India, I want to show the same time to convert automatically in IST time, and show to the some website or something. And if I'm in the US or in some other zone, the same database entry I want to show in the current zone. So how how we can do that? Exactly. So um, you, but you would know what time zone the user is in, right? Yeah, that is the thing exactly. I want to know. So you'd know, right? No, like if I'm anywhere, I just want to know there is there may be some function or there may be some method from where we can get the current time zone, and then we can replace from the current time zone. Oh, for that uh, you have to use like actually. Uh, this, this thing called GUIP, like you try to determine the current time zone of that user using their IP address and all. So that PyTZ is not doing that? Like no, PyTZ is in, is in the Python level, right? So what PyTZ does is, you tell PyTZ, boss, this is my daytime object, this is my uh, time zone, I want you to give this daytime object in this time zone. So I have 2015 first January, okay, and I have a time zone IST, I want the equivalent of 2015 first January. Okay. So, uh, one question. So, if you have a client server application mm -hmm. and you want to sync time between the client and the server, do you have any suggestions for that? Sync that. Uh, so, uh, there are uh, time servers uh, to sync up with, right? So, uh, 
actually i didn't get the complete question like when you say sync do you want the server to be uh, like just can you explain it better yeah so uh, what i'm trying to say is like i have a client and server running at the same time correct but they may be in different time zones okay and uh, basically i want to uh, sync up like uh, when the client is running for whatever time duration it ran the same uh, time the server was also available and so we are basically mapping time sync between both of them okay so is there a way to do that in a, i mean uh, you have any suggestions yeah like it's a actually um, what basically you have to do is like the client is going to say that uh, my current time is this what's your current time right and the server is going to tell me like okay you are at 2015 first january i am at 2015 second january and the client being a client should be accepting what the server is saying like it's always like bade correct hota right so server is right so okay like update the time so it's actually not related to date time it's more like about uh, tcp com communications okay thank you thank you, thank you guys